Hello everybody, if it's Wednesday, it's Warhammer, and that must mean it's time for another episode of Warhammer Weekly. Joining me as always, my only co-host who ever has existed and ever will exist, it's Tyler. What's up buddy? Number one. How you doing? Good to see you, good to see everybody. Absolutely. Also joining us this week, back on the show, and I couldn't be more thrilled, from the Antipodean, the other side of the world... It's AOS coach, Anthony, what's up, brother? How you doing? It's the site that didn't get any increases on GW prices last night, so I'm sure <laughs> this will be more of a talking point today, but I couldn't be happier to live down under. Yeah, there you go. Absolutely. It's the middle of summer. You, uh, it's, it's beautiful weather. You're not getting a price increase. What's, what's to complain about? It's, it's a great time. Everything is coming up Millhouse. That's right. You've got a beautiful new venue for yeah. your event uh it's it's uh it's it's exciting all around so tonight we're going to talk about something very interesting and new brought to us by our one and only co-host tyler uh, as well as many others who i'm sure he will he will thank uh appropriately as as many people have had input onto this uh but we're going to talk about some new battle plans but but and we're going to talk about why we think they're necessary and the nature of uh, the current state of battle plans in 3.0, i.e. what makes them good, what makes them bad, because I think after, the, you know, we've all attended a good number of tournaments now, and uh, I've got some opinions. That's what I'll say. Uh, but first, of course, the news. Tyler, what do we got? So, Vince, despite you getting a education in engineering, I am hearing audio issues. Coach, are you hearing that? What do you Kind of cutting out a little bit? No, that might just be on our end. I'm sure. I'm sure the chat will uh, rage up when the, it's like literally one of their favorite things is like, is Tom late? Is that Vince's sound okay? Right. So, right. Um, right. if I was you, Vince, I would incorporate this engagement with like a, a YouTube poll, right? Um, will we be late? Is my voice okay? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, okay, no, everybody else said it's good. It might just be... Now, Vince, your audio level. level. It might just be Discord being hot garbage. Sometimes it can be a bit okay. funny. Yeah. That can happen, too. Just be me. But anyways, okay. take I us don't. through the news right. just there, Because sure. you, you sound crystal clear, regardless of how I sound. So. Okay, excellent. All right, well, I'm on the show again. So, of course, it's a 40K rumor engine. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, let's move on with our lives. <laughs> yep. Next. Who cares? I feel like I've... Said, yep. <laughs> And let's see, we've got, we had a Sunday preview, so another sign that they're behind on shipping things. We're getting the 2021 Tome of Champions for Warcry in 2022. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the look of these boxes, though. Uh, we're getting a Thunderstrike Stormcast Eternals, looks like three Annihilators with big hammers, five and Vindictors, we're getting some snakes for Daughters of Cain. I see these boxes, Lumineth, Lanesh, and Cruel Boys. First of all, every single uh, box thing they have, there's going to be a Slanesh version. Because they're like, look, we got to move this product somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. At this point, it's like day old, uh, like day old tuna salad. We got to get it out of here. It's not, it's not aging well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I thought they were real good. The, the, um, the, uh, like these Warcry boxes were traditionally a really awesome place to get a good amount of miniatures at a really good price. And so I'm glad to see them back again. Yeah. Coach, what about you? What do you think? Not bad. If you're looking for models, I think they're, they're cool. Um, if I was looking at them for match play and to incorporate into my next tournament list, I think question mark, but I think from for a Warcry point of view, yeah, they're cool. Yeah. It's it's a good yeah, way to pick up yeah, a couple of units. Like I like the Grand Hammer boys getting in there because I think those are obviously a very solid unit that's underrated right now. Um, and I think that the uh, I think Mergonk showed that you can use those quite effectively. Um, and yeah. my answer is the uh, you know like if if you remember back when these first came like these this first go round of those boxes. Picking up a couple of those was just a super good way to get hot units. So it really depends on whether or not the units in them are good, because they generally were pretty pretty strongly discounted. Um, so I hope to see the same thing again. Definitely. Uh, let's see. We have Golden Demon at yep. Adepticon 2022. Vince, you want to say anything about that? 
Uh, obviously, if you're going to be participating, it is a very good idea to download your form and fill it out in advance to be a responsible person. I don't, I don't know how they're going to run this in the U.S. this time. Um, I'll just very quickly walk everybody who, who might be attending, who's who, had, who hasn't previously attended a U.K. event. The way this works previously is in the U.K. events, you could sign up on Saturday. So you have to go in, you fill out the form, one for each entry. You turn the form into the desk people. They give you a little entry card. You take that in. Basically, that gets torn and then handed to the, the person who puts it in the case. Now, Golden Demon runs. It's only recently they started allowing the Saturdays entries. It used to be just on Sunday. You would show up Sunday morning. You'd fill it out. You'd turn it in. You'd uh, And then they do the judging in a couple hours. Like You had a couple hours to turn everything in, a couple hours to do the judging, and then it was over. I mean, it was like a five-hour thing total. It was insane which is always crazy to me because I want to sit around and stare at the things in the case. That's half the fun. Um, obviously, you know, Warhammer Fest is usually a much shorter thing, uh, but Adepticon is basically four long days. So are they going to start allowing people to come in on Thursday and submit? I hope so. And let things sit in the case. I think that would be the way to go, just like the previous competitions of all the, and all the ones that are running have done. Um, and then you clo- they close it down at some point whenever and then do their judging. Um, but fill out the form in advance. I'll, I promise you it'll make things a lot faster. Uh, because you don't want to just sit there at the side of the desk and be writing all this out. It's a decent enough form. And then you just walk up, turn them in, they hand you your cards, you're out a couple seconds. So that's what I'll say. Um, I'm looking forward to see everything that's going to be there. I think it's going to be an absolutely bonkers year. So uh should be a lot of fun. Good. All right, so some news that I'm very excited about. We got a couple of SKU codes for Sylvaneth, and it looks like July is when the Battle Tome is going to be dropping. So, Do you guys see anything else? That I no, I, I have not seen anything else, here. but I'm excited about it too. Coach, I want to get your take on this. I hope that this proves I was wrong last week and that it's not that that summer book is not Lumineth. That would be so great. I would love it to be Sylvaneth. That's the one that really needs it. It's the one we all want. So if I'm wrong and and you know and and my my prediction of the worst of all possible worlds is not true, that's a win for me. I've never been more happy to be wrong. Uh, clearly, we're getting something for Sylvaneth released in July, at least as of right now. So yeah, I hope so. Coach, what's your take? Happy. It's what I thought it was going to be. Um, I put my line in the sand to say Sylvaneth because it also ties well into the narrative. Nurgle has risen. Um, I think it allows things like Skaven to come in as well, especially maybe for Clan Pestilence to return back to the fold. But certainly I think the Sylvaneth with the... When you look at Broken Realms and you imagine that Broken Realms will be off the shelf eventually, which were the War Scrolls and the Allegiance abilities most up impacted by the Broken Realms? And Sylvaneth with the Warsong Revenant Alariel, the uh, the trees that have changed a million times, um, like they they are in a good position. So I'm happy. I had heard rumors that it was going to be Seraphon versus Skaven, and I'm not mm-hmm. happy with that. So Sylvaneth is a big win for me. I I have to imagine they do a battle box for this, but what a weird showdown! Like mm-hmm. the Skaven versus Sylvaneth is just a weird match. Um, I don't, they don't seem to have many occasions to run into each other. Uh, so it would just, it's going to be a strange box, but who cares? The narrative of the boxes are all clearly just whatever they happen to shove together. Like it doesn't matter. We just had two order forces fighting each other. Like it's their boxes have not always been logical, so it doesn't really matter. Right. (laughs) Um, Josh A said, does the Toma champions 2021 mean we get AOS models for Skaven? Mm, No. (laughs) No, but what they have said is in the Tome of Champions is all of the Underworlds uh, warbands finally having rules in Warcry, which is fantastic. That I am very excited about. So that's a great thing. Thumbs yes. up to that. Uh, that is good. Um, and I am I am all for this. I am more of this kind of thing. Uh, so yeah, but anyways, you know, if we get the box, maybe it'll all be Pestilence because that would be kind of the logical thing to fight the Sylvaneth, which means that I... Mm-hmm. Which would be cool, because then I can just not care at all about buying the box, and it'll be great. Win-win. Would, being, a, being a Skaven person, Vince, yes. um, if there was a hero in the box, 
Um, is there a hero that's kind of uh, missing at the moment from the pestilence side? Obviously, it could be anything Skaven. It could be a vermin lord. It could be some minor hero. But if it was like Scryer or Pestilence, do you think there's a gap at the moment that could be filled with this hero? So my answer is there. there's a lot of Skaven heroes already, like a lot, um, many that are pretty worthless. Uh, and the, you know, like what, pe what Pestilence doesn't have is sort of a foot melee hero, I suppose. They have, you know, their foot priest. And then their wagon priest. So maybe if it was like some kind of pestilent melee guy, which means that it will be doubly worthless because uh, <laughs> because generally melee foot heroes are are worthless unless they're allowing something on utility, um, which would be pretty easy to do. You you know if you if you went the Namardi route and gave some kind of rerolls or something like that, that would actually be pretty good for the pestilence guys around there. Um, but you know the the regular. Plague Priest is one of the best models in the range right now. He's one of the best heroes in the in the game. Um being in like an 85 point priest who can who can take curse. So there's not really a huge amount of space, but if it if it is going to be a pestilence thing, yeah, it'd be probably some kind of melee sensor bearer type of guy. I mean, you used to be able to give hero sensors in the old, you know, in the in the in the old world, right? You could you could build basically the equivalent of a pestilence hero by giving him a big sensor and letting him swing that thing around. Um but you know, I'm still I'm still questionable on Skaven getting any kind of resculps for the new for for the, for the the potential book release, which I, I'm still putting my money on the Razor in. I mean, if it's July, you would imagine there'll be some form of bigger release, given that it's the start of their financial year, that June kind of period. So they'd mm -hmm. want to start with a bang. They're not just going to throw down an army like a like a, bo a book. They'll want to have a good amount of sales. And especially since it's the off-season for AOS and it's the off-season for 40K, there'll be something else, whether it's Warcry, um, The Hobbit, whatever it might be. They'll yeah, I mean, we're on the third-year cycle for Warcry, right? So the, the it's a strong possibility we'd get, quote-unquote, new edition of Warcry, a thing probably not needed. Warcry's fine. Like, it's fine. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> it's a great game. But yeah, I agree with you, Coach, right? They've got to put out something that's going to move plastic in that time period. That That's their time period, right? I haven't heard anything about new skin models, but I have heard from a few different folks over the last six months that have at least new units. So we'll see. Time and a new unit for Sylvanath, that is. Yeah. Just just make Doom Wheels great again. That's all I want. Like, that's all we Give me a hero that, that, that surfs at a Doom Wheel and we have Doom Wheel meta. Um, it's what we all want. It's amazing. what we all want. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, boys. So we've got pricing news. Everybody, yes, favorite topic. Uh, this of course has been going around today on Twitter, on the tw uh, on the social medias. Uh, let's see. Getting into the details, looks like about five percent is what they're claiming on average. Of course, coach. Uh, given they've already you know, squeezed as much blood out of that diamond of Australia <laughs> and New Zealand. Yossi, Yossi, no imprint for us. <laughs> yep. too much, no more. <laughs> yep. And the Japan yen is fine, China, fine. They had a number of details in this article. I'm sure everybody has seen it by now. The price effect is going to happen March of 7th. Uh, I know, you know, there's some things that are not going to be going up. Paints, brushes, tools, paint sets. They said the majority of starter sets are not going to be going up. You know, we've gone through this a number of times before. I saw the Blood Bowl go up, I think. Uh, they said a few things. 10% Blood Bowl, around 20%. Blood Bowl teams and metal miniatures. So, personally, I, you know, like, I, don't, I never know what to say about these things uh, without turning this into a political economy show, uh, which Vince knows <laughs> I'd be happy to give a two-hour lecture on <laughs> the past century of political economies and my views on those things. And the, the state of, of our structural our structures within a global society, but uh, setting that aside, I don't know if you guys have any thoughts on that. On that yeah, news. I mean, Coach, you go ahead. You go first. Uh, obviously, you as an unaffected an party, you're neutral, right? So, yeah, and, and you know, like I'm going to put my hat on that I'm a banker and I'm a corporate white collar dude. So, um, I have a different perspective, and I can appreciate at a macro level that you know a lot of things have gone up and this is already an expensive hobby so 
to to squeeze five percent extra out of us and then you know your uber eats has gone up and your netflix has gone up and everything else goes up you know there's only so much disposable income and that until something's got to give right so uh, and wages aren't going up so i appreciate and i apologize at the same time games workshop has also had increased um well increased profits but they've certainly increased their expenses and being share having shareholders and you know profitability there's a lot that kind of underlines this so look at the end of the day as well most people aren't buying retail from games workshop to be honest you're all getting 10 percent, 20 percent off some, from some type of flgs so like it's not that big of a deal but i do empathize and i do know that um, this will hurt, hit the pocket somewhere. Yeah, I think that's pretty reasonable. Right. I mean, look, this is certainly the topic du jour, and lots of people have lots of strong opinions on it. Uh, you know, prices will rise, politicians will philander, and you two will get old. Um, the, um, you know, my general feeling on it is that it was inevitable. We had dodged it for a couple years because probably, I suspect because of the pandemic and even they're not tone deaf and know that that is, is would be insane. Um, so they, they do this. Um, you know, my advice as always is try to get the most out of the miniatures that you have. You like, there's lots of other games you can use your miniatures for make your hobby dollars count. Don't spend the money. If you don't want to, I'm, I'm less concerned about them, rising the price uh, some small amount on x number of kits and more concerned about like what are they paying their people uh and that kind of thing like with recent things like that they've they've derived an unmitigated amount of of profit and they've delivered great shareholder value and and all of that and i'm sure that i'm sure that's great if you know I, if you're a shareholder of gw i'm sure you're quite happy with them over the past couple of years um, I'd like to see them take good care of the people who are there. And that doesn't mean like uh, a bonus at the end of the year. That means actually increasing their pay and stuff like that. Those are real kinds of things, not just a one year thing. Um, if I knew they were doing that and moving up to market rates for a lot of their standard jobs, honestly, I would have much less of a concern with, uh, a, you know, an extra couple of dollars on my plastic toys. So that's always my chief concern because I can always just not buy a kit. Right. But the people who work there have to feed their families and put clothes on their backs and, and stuff like that. So and I, you know, that given recent stories, that's what I want to see them do. Um, so there you go. And I don't think they'd report that in the news, but they should. Um, they should address that and then and then talk about it. Uh, but anyways, there you go. That's that's my my feeling on the whole thing. Like, as always, there are lots of good options out there for miniatures and only more every day. So, you know if 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 the price increase offends you and you don't want to give them your dollars i say yeah okay you know good there's lots of there there are lots of good options we live in the golden age of miniatures and it's a it's a great time to decide exactly where your budget is going to go and always try to use those miniatures in as many games as possible to get maximum fun from them there you go cool absolutely that's anything else I, that's all i have for the news nope all right. Awesome. Very good. Uh, well, gentlemen, uh, with that, Vince suddenly remembers he has to timestamp stuff and uh, quickly grabs his notes to do that. Uh, let's do some pick of the week. Coach, what would you like to share with everybody? So many great content creators. So little time. Um, my first shout out would be um, the Azir Weekly, um, which is a Twitter, mm. uh, also on Facebook, but um, certainly a lot of laughs. Uh, great, a great person in your chat as well. Um, they're always, you know, very witty and they're always, always on the pulse when it comes to meme worthy news. So um, I definitely shout out the Azir Weekly. Um, Hunch, hunch, a, bunch of, a bunch of new podcasts have kind of hit my radar lately. Um, you know, Runax is a, is a really good one that I've really enjoyed from my local scene, but there's a whole bunch of new little podcasts popping up. So uh, Mad Men, I think it's Mad Men Gaming as well, has done a couple of really good UK um, interviews lately. I think Steve Curtis and there was a couple of um, uh, Alex J Ghost Arm as well. So um, shout them out and then I'd, I'd be remiss not to shout myself out who has <laughs> oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna well I got you I got you let, 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 let Tyler, everybody but, but yeah, yeah. I've, I've been booking shows uh, pump your ego up a little bit yeah <laughs> Tyler jump yeah, right yeah, into it go for it buddy <laughs> you've been kicking ass on all these shows you've been doing and 
Uh, we were joking before the show that uh, Coach makes our lives vastly more complicated because he gets all the guests before we do. Yeah. And so you always have to ca- you know, look at Coach's channel to see if he has already first covered the topic that we had in mind to cover. And then is he booked the guests that you had in mind to cover the topic that we were going to cover? <laughs> and usually the answer is yes. He's done both of those things. So, <laughs> but no, uh, the Phoenician show was awesome. I had a chance to hang out with James Tapia and Jeremy Lefebvre, uh, who went 5-0. We were at Flying Monkey together, some, some yeah. friends of mine. We had dinner. Jeremy, great guy, incredibly good at the game, obviously, you know. Uh, that, that was a really excellent show. And yeah, Joe Vucic. Uh, Joe Vucic? I've actually never said Joe's last name out loud. I uh, hung out with him over the weekend, a number of guys on Sunday at this a beginner-friendly tournament that Mitchum Ernest organized in Oklahoma. And Mitchum is the guy behind the Great Plain Masters. So uh, really, really awesome. And that was a great video on, on Living Cities, too. So yeah, man, you're rocking it. A couple of interesting shows. I've got Gavin coming up next week, I think it is, to talk about like mindset and like what does it take to actually do really well in a tournament. But I'd probably give a shout out in particular to a Beast of Chaos list I'm going to be talking about with Matt Newen, um, known on Twitter, on, uh, sorry, on Discords and Twitters as Roz. Um, went four and one with Beast of Chaos at the LVO. Mm-hmm. So um, what an absolute legend Matt is. And he's, he's in there when celebrated with actually a Beast of Chaos tattoo. So, what a time to be alive. That's amazing. Oh, I wanted to mention a couple battle report, uh, battle report channels. The first, the die is cast. So, some Wisconsin gentlemen. Yeah, they've been doing some great content. They're actually going to be releasing a battle report on Sunday, it's looking like, featuring one of the new battle plans we'll be discussing tonight. I think it's going to be focal points. So, yeah, if anybody, you know, I've been crazy busy with work, haven't had a chance to reach out to many channels, inviting them, you know, if they'd like to, obviously it'd be amazing to see some of these battle plans and YouTube channels, but anybody's interested, that, that would be fantastic. We'd be happy to talk about it on the show, mention it. Uh, they're doing great stuff. Another one is Hammer of War that I've been following for some time. Uh, Coach, have you seen these guys, what they're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're quite active in my Discord, funnily enough. Um, really nice. good. There's some really good ones, even like Bulldog Hammer, which um, uh, did really well at the LVO, Yuri, and um, uh, Mom, who's coming on my channel. Uh, There's a lot of like, you know, you, you scratch the surface with like re-rolling ones and Season of War. There's a lot of really good unknown battle reports that you're calling out, and we uh, could probably do another five or ten. Oh, well, leave it there. But yeah, I've watched quite a few of those lately. It's a cool format, a little bit of season of war, a little bit of narrative. They do a nice job of giving their analysis of the decisions that they made, you know, for better or worse, uh, which really thought that that's a nice element that I haven't seen a whole lot. So yeah. Uh, I was sold on Hammer of War when I was doing the, I had not heard of them until you sent me the link. Uh, but when I was doing, like copying the links into the description, as always, links in the description for all these things mentioned. Um, I noticed that the the like thumbnail image picture for their channel was Sinessa, was a Slanesh model, and I was like, all right, well, I'm in for these oh, people. Yeah. So uh, whoever they are, they've got my vote. So you know, I'm down. Uh, my pick of the week is slightly different, a little more hobby focused content. Uh, Fifty Two Miniatures, a fantastic content producer and painter and human being, uh, put out a really really cool video about painting a little miniature library for a library it's 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 a strange story you'll have to watch it but he's painting a tiny library to go to to be a library for libraries to celebrate libraries you'll get it um but i really loved it because it was just such a really cool uh like it was such a really cool project and watching how he he sort of got into all of it and created it and it, it was it uh i just love diorama scenes like that and people who kind of create interesting stuff out of out, out of just kind of nothing right he started from nothing and then had this little mock-up of the i think it's in stockholm or something i'm not sure but they're their big special library so check it out it's super cool it's a great little project it'll give you lots of ideas for for your own uh mini dioramas or display boards or anything like that if you're a gamer uh i, I think it would be awesome like i could totally see translating what he did there into a display board coach that was that had a, a like a cities of sigmar theme for the collegiate arcane or something where you're actually in the like collegiate arcane library right it'd be amazing there was, there was a diorama last year that was like an undead ballroom it was like a you know elizabethan type um room but they'd use the war not the war cry the um underworld's um war bands and different things to create 
you know, I think there's a lot we could learn. And that's something that I've been watching a lot of is like the gun plaz, looking yeah. at dollhouse videos, looking at things outside the community to go, how does that translate into Age of Sigma? How yep. can I take that effect and bring it in? And you'd be amazed. Yep. hundred percent. Uh, it just got oh. me really interested because most of the, most of the display boards I've built are really like exterior locations, right? Uh, it's it's sort of easy to do dirt and stuff like that. Like here again, this is my finished display board behind me is an exterior location, right? And the more I thought about it and watched what he did, I was like, oh man, we could do some really cool interior location display boards of like putting people in a space, a place in the world. Uh, the world of like 3D printing, because that's a lot of what he used. Like he 3D printed a lot of the little accoutrement tables and chairs and the stacks of books and stuff for it. And I was like, wow, yeah, re we really have opened up. You don't have to craft that stuff from scratch anymore, right? Like those STL files exist. So just really got me thinking. So it's a very cool video. Great journey. Check it out. Uh, and I think like the prime, I think he has a photo of the prime minister or something like that. Um, actually looking at his, his thing that he made, which is super cool. Um, anyways, so yeah, check it out. All right. Very good. Gentlemen, let's talk about some hobby time. Uh, hobby time. Coach, what's been on your desk? What have you been up to, brother? So, I got TikTok shamed the other day. Uh, uh -oh. Someone tagged me on TikTok and, like, like they heard me talking about TikTok and they're like, where is he? And I actually tagged myself and Rob Symes, the Honest Wargamer, and I actually went, right, I'm going to get back onto TikTok and I'm going to film some hobby videos. And this week or the last couple of days, I've been working on two pieces um, one, I have stripped back my old Warhammer Citadel because it's going to be a part of my armies on parade board. So I wanted something just, you know, low key that I could paint. And then I've got a tournament coming up at the end of the month. And I've decided I'm going to bring the big boys out again because I don't want to, uh, I'm in the middle of projects. I've just finished Daughters of Cain. I'm just starting up Stormcast for armies on parade. And I can just paint one of these guys, um, and I can run my son's army. So, um, this is my war stomper. Nice. 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 Awesome. I love it. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, glad to see that the, the the boys have been having a rough time lately, but they are still... A, it's funny. They're such an interesting... They're in such an interesting place in the meta right now, right? Where it's like some armies, they just out and out trounce and beat basically at setup. And other armies, you're like, well, we're dead. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of things, I'd love to see get a new book. Maybe don't mess the second one up. Okay, so, um, but I love the Suns. I really do. They're so cool, and I think for me at the moment, um, you know, for anyone who's followed my channel in the past, I went through four months of hard lockdown. And you made a comment at the start of the show, and you said um, we've all been to tournaments. Actually, I haven't. This is my first mm -hmm. third edition tournament I'm going to because literally oh. everything's been cancelled, and I was in hard lockdown for four months. So for me, I'm going to take mm. four boys, I'm going to push them around, I'm going to have some laughs, and I'll get back into that tournament mindset. Because right now, everything's been so stop-start for us. I, I can't get into pure ITC kind of focused competitive play right, because right. it's been hard to commit. Yeah, no, mm. makes sense. That's rough. Absolutely makes sense. Tyler, did you pay anything this week? You're going to do this for the rest of my life that I'm on the show, aren't you? Correct. That, that, that question. Yes. Okay, cool. Just just so everybody knows that's 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 Tyler, that's I want you to imagine the week where you do paint something. <laughs> I want you to think about the payoff that's gonna have. You're, you're okay? gonna be, maybe if you sweeten the pot a little bit. I don't know. Figure I, something out. Sure, absolutely. Hit like if you want to see Tyler paint something sometime and surprise me. Hit that like button. There hey, we go. That ain't, that ain't gonna do it. That's hey, I'm just saying, that's something. <laughs> Fiverr or something like pay somebody a couple of dollars to paint your minis like, at least try right. at least try no it's it's end. did you get some I'm games in you mentioned out. you were doing a little game hangout what was yeah. uh, what was happening yeah no uh i love the this whole beginner friendly tournament idea and it worked mitchum had we had 20 guys and gals out for it as probably about half really experienced players be a third truly new players and you know the other third maybe gone to a couple of tournaments but still pretty new uh, it was a nice mix. Yeah, I had all of us old timers playing. We're supposed to be playing toned down list. I think some of us, maybe myself included, accidentally didn't quite follow the script as well as we should have. <laughs> Turned out my Stormcast list was pretty good. I didn't have any fulminators, long strikes, or you know, I didn't have any of the junk. But you know, Stormcast, they're they're good. What do you want? 
But anyway, yeah, it was a good time. And the other side of the hobby we're going to be talking about here in a minute. I work on it. Oh, I do need to put out a ask for everybody who is listening, including me. Ready. Coach. So I am a, <laughs> I am desperate need of people who have 3D printers who can print stuff, print terrain. So I, about nine months ago, I talked about this community terrain project and then got sidetracked by other projects like Warcoda. Now, finally getting back into it, we're going to get as much done as we can before the May events, uh, the GT we've got coming up locally. But this project, I'll have more to say about it soon. I mean, it's really going to be oriented for the entire community around the world. But I need to get some 3D printers. So if anybody has any cycles available, let me know, comment, shoot me, hit, hit me up on Twitter, Scrubbing Wells, wherever. Let me know. If only you had a public voice that you could ask people for this donation. <laughs> only, exactly. <laughs> only people knew about you and your cause. I'm sure that the the Thank community you. will will rally. There, there's a couple people in this chat right now I know who are who've uh, who participate in that 3D printing lifestyle. Really? All right, deeply my, appreciate it, everybody. Awesome, awesome. Uh, my hobby time was very busy week. Uh, it's been a ridiculously busy week. Um, that thing is basically done. I need to print out my little name placard for the front of it. Uh, that's the only thing remaining to do. Uh, I finished everything up before the show. So that's the new stupid display board done. Uh, so that giant waste of time. Um, the, you know, after the, we, I went to a tournament this weekend, obviously. So um, Brew Hammer was this weekend. Great, great time. Uh, very nice venue. Uh, it was in a brewery. It was funny because all of us nerds are walking through all the normies who are like sitting out because they've got like coffee and other drinks too. And it's clearly like a chill place where a lot of people in that area of town just go to, you know, read and work on their scripts or whatever. And, you know, us nerds keep filtering in and out because we're in the back, like in the brewery area where it was where it was set up next to all the tanks. And I just imagine they have to be like, what are, what is this? What is going on here in my, in my coffee shop or my, my, uh, you know, my beer hall. And so it was a great time. Uh, Chris and everybody who was involved, they ran a great, uh, sh great tournament. Smooth. It was easy. Um, had five very fun games. I was running, obviously, Karzai, uh, you know, like a very Karzai focused list. Um, who's who really does dominate sort of the, 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 the rest of the list. Um, very quickly to give everybody just a very, very fast rundown. Here you go. I played uh, Takeover Mars, game one. It was just random pairing. It was great. He was there. The first time I've ever met him in person. And uh, so got to talk to him and uh, play him game one. Um, he was playing Slanesh, of course. That was a win for me. Uh, game two uh, was... Who did I... I'm trying to remember the order of all this. So I'll probably get something wrong. Um, okay, so I played that. I'm not going to be able to do these in order. Because uh, already it's all slipped from my mind. I the, I played Lumineth, and that person ended up getting fourth. And they had 30 Sentinels and three Foxes to, like, up against my all-melee Stormcast list. So that was a loss. <laughs> uh, that was pretty pretty straightforward there. But um, no, any, anything you could have done differently? Anything, that, any, uh, you know, openings, opportunities, things you missed? He outdropped me. I mean, I was two drops to his one drop, so he gave me first. Okay, because I had actually set up as such where he couldn't alpha strike me because of what I had kept in the heavens and because of the range of how I had set the board. So there was no ability for him to alpha strike me with all of his stuff, with all of his shooting. Okay, which meant he gave me first turn, mm -hmm. which meant my best hope was basically to drop on him and then hope to breathe hard with everything that had a breath weapon and reorient the battlefield completely like i i you know because it, it's a it was a it was one of the um it was one of the it was the five point scenario not yeah Sorry. power struggle it was power struggle that's what it was which is a really hard one because you got to hold things for two turns and all this the problem was he first of all a very good player um ben was his name and really nice guy like super duper nice guy very enjoyable game despite the fact that i was on the heels from the beginning I basically tried to, he castled, so I tried to punish him for it by pushing him over, like dropping everything on his left and trying to sweep down the line. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. Like, land a couple lucky charges. Um, I had my triumph so I could reroll two charges in a turn, right? And land a couple lucky charges and then start sweeping into his line where I was chewing him up and he couldn't go forward to get out into the board 
was basically the idea of the thing. Okay. That did not work. I landed. My breaths all did nothing. And all my charges failed. And then he double turned me. <laughs> so, you know. I'm lucky to see cogs, man. That was. Like, that was. To solve all your problems. Well, nobody would have been near the cogs because I didn't have a caster I could have dropped over there. But. And, oh, and solve all your problems. Wild and he's Illumineth. He would have unbound it. Anyways. Um, but So that was a loss. But it was a very fun game. Um, but, you know, like every time I tried to move, three foxes were suddenly in front of me. Right. Until until it was time to charge. And then they were a million miles away. Like that's that's what it was. Like every unit I had did not move because there was always three foxes in front of them. Um, I think I actually made one real charge in that game and killed a unit of 10 wardens. Yes. <laughs> Good times. Um, the uh, I played Skaven, like a crazy Skaven list with four. John? What's that? John, I've, I've just pulled out BCP, oh. so I've, I've actually got your roster now. So There you go. That's... Yes, you do. Um, well, the... This is what a co-host should be doing. Well, no, no. I appreciate that's, that. That's, that's too, that's... You're, you're, I love from the other side of the world, you can know the list and who I played against. Yeah, it was great. Um, it was a very fun Skaven list. He had a ton of bodies, a bunch of clan rats and storm vermin, and four vermin lords. Four. Mm. Four vermin lords. <laughs> and... Uh, my dragons proved ineffective yet again as they were, um, as, as <laughs> there's like two of them stuck up fighting various vermin lords and, and rats and stuff. Uh, the funny part of this game, I'll just tell, the, I'll share the funny moments because who cares about anything else? The funny part about this game was there was a death master, you know, the stupid Skaven assassin guy who's like totally worthless fighting my dragons amongst some other stuff. They're not really paying attention to him. So he's just kind of over there stabbing them. I could not make a save. This guy would be like, hit every time, wound every time, I'd drop every save. <laughs> this dude was just a murderer. He's just putting like, wounds on dragons. One ran, one ran D3 damage or something. Right. It just it just wasn't anything, and he just kept tearing through oh. me. He, he had like eight wounds on one of the dragons before finally I turned to him and was like, that's it, squish this guy, and just, <laughs> just squished him out of existence. But he sat there and just was just chipping away. Um... The other fun part about that game, just to give you a good example of how I tended to roll in this tournament. Um, not that, like, blaming rolling isn't a good way to go, but this was a particularly interesting one because even this game and player was like, wow, you're not very good at rolling. <laughs> so I had Karzai hit the... Karzai is a big 160 mil base. And he had set up his, his Storm Vermin and his Clan Rats in this sort of, like, cloud formation that left exactly the right size pocket for Karzai to sit in the middle. Okay, so where he could charge everything. He charged both units and he had a vermin lord within three inches. One of Karzai's attacks is his tail, which has a which has a number of attacks equal to the number of models within three inches of him. Which these are twenty five mil base Skaven. I had nineteen models within three inches of me. Okay. So nineteen tail attacks. He was fully buffed, so he was on twos and twos. Neg two rend, two damage each. I was like, 19 attacks? All right, look, I'll, I'll take... I was like, I'm going to split these. This many are going into the, the Storm Vermin, and then I'll take seven... Yeah, I think I put seven into the Clan Rats. I was like, twos and twos, seven of the Clan Rats, two apiece. I'll do some big damage to that unit. I killed six Clan Rats. They didn't get a save against this attack. I want to point this out. This is a... They do not have a save against that attack. I killed six clan rats. I was like, yeah, it feels good. All right, right on. But that was a fun game. So that was a win. Did you uh, die and you dice before your next opponent? Because just... your next opponent would have given you a real tough time. So you've got to get like those dice jail. You got to like, guys, see what those those dice did? Do not do that or you go in the bin. Like this is your warning dice. Yeah. I I fought then I, then I played Anthony actually, who's in the chat right now. Is my game for just randomly paired up. So that was pretty fun. Um he again commented on my dice after cards I went up again on twos and twos and I missed with half of all his attacks like literally half would roll I'd roll and I'd pull out and whatever number I rolled I half of those would be ones I was just like this is unreal <laughs> but it was a fun game um it was the the fun moment from the game with Anthony was a thunder strike thing happened you know like when skate when stormcast die you roll the thunder strike dice so Karzai had yeah. like one wound left. He killed a thing. 
that thing exploded, killed Karzai, uh. Karzai exploded, killed a thing, and then that thing killed something else. It was just like, boom, 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 boom. Like this Thunderstrike nuclear <laughs> mushroom cloud went off as everything took everything out in Thunderstrikes. So that was a fun game. That was a win. And then my game five started a little contentious uh, with some playing by intention type of confusion. The player was really nice, really good guy. He's from uh, up in Milwaukee. Um, we sort of reset real early. I, was, I just stopped and was like, okay, we got to talk. We had a little talk. And then the rest of the game was real good. And we, we understood how each other was sort of playing and 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 had a really nice game um, that really came down to like the clutch. Um, at the end of the game, I was one point up on him from battle points, but he got his grand strat and I didn't. So he won by two. So that was my game five. Really, really, really fun game. But lots of very back and forth. So it's a good time. So there you go. Awesome, man. Congrats in particular to Tom Guan for finally getting that 5-0. Yeah, he it was great. had a long string of four ones. Yeah. It was uh it was a heck of a match too against that Futh and Ideness list, mm -hmm. list. Like that was a that was a banger of a game five. That people should look up that IDK mm -hmm. Futh and list on BCP. It's brutal. Uh, because again, it's 120 shots on twos and twos coming out of those reavers. Just, <laughs> just death, just death. Yeah, right. Throw down curse and you're in a real bad time. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. um, at any rate, it was, uh, it was a very fun tournament. They're going to do it again next year. I hope to see everybody, uh, I hope to see some people there again next year, but yeah, great, great, great time. Great players, great opponents, great games. Can't complain. So now, and then Holy Wars is this weekend. So. There you go. Yeah. I mean, I am incredibly jealous. I live vicariously through LVO and BCP right now because just I, my tournament scene is resetting. Um, and hopefully you, we'll be back soon. But um, I'm certainly living vicariously through, you know, people like Rob who's streaming from mobile phones, from BCP. There's <laughs> any way I can get Age of Sigma in real life right now. There you go. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Uh, all right, so with that done, uh, gentlemen, shall we turn to the main topic of the uh, the main topic du jour? Uh, so Let's do it tonight. We're going to talk about battle plans. Let's put this guy away and go over here. I'm just going to bring up this picture of first blood to to lead the first part of the discussion. So we're going to start off talking about battle plan sort of strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Um. Okay, uh, let me, thesis statement. Uh, yeah, quick shout out, by the way, before we get into this. Jay Irby, who uh, had, was there, I did not get to play Jay. Jay had a beautifully painted Slanesh army. He ended up taking second in the, the best painted, and that was very well deserved. Jay, your, your army was absolutely gorgeous. I, I want you to know that you did get uh, my vote, Jay, so um, that's just, so you know that. Um, really, really wonderful looking army, so I hope to see you again there, Jay, and I can't wait to see what you got. Um, okay, so um, the uh, the current crop of battle plans. Here's my thesis statement. You ready? They're not very good. Um, a lot of them have flaws that make them lead to inequitous blowouts too easily. There is about five-ish of them that I think are tournament worthy. And I think the rest, when you put them in there, you're basically accepting that you're getting a subpar battle plan that is going to be swingy, weird, or all in all, not that great for having a, a good even matchup that can actually go and give a good four or five rounds of play. And to me, the distinction between that is how close does it hew to the sort of what I would think of as the standard setup. And I've got the image for First Blood up here on the screen right now because to me, First Blood is almost the perfect scenario. The deployment zones are tight. They are distant. It is harder to alpha strike. It is interesting to chaff because of the nature of the sort of Tetris piece uh, line, right? Um your like if you want to be under one row of chaff and have your whole army in a tight castle you have to back corner right you if you think mm -hmm. about length versus length you know length versus length you can corner you can castle right in the middle and you've got relatively clean access to the whole board right at the same mm -hmm. time it hews very close to the score one score two score more right that's how you get the points 
its benefit to controlling the thing that you care about is not more victory points. It's an interesting in-game thing, an extra CP. Mm -hmm. Right? It doesn't get unusually screwed by seismic shift, which many of them do, Mm -hmm. which that we'll talk about. Uh, And instead, it gets really interesting with seismic shift because the nature of where the three objectives are, they're they're sort of hypotenused distance from each other. And, and, And in this one, deciding to go second or give away the priority on three to like take their objective away from them is actually a really impactful choice. Yeah. Right. Because cutting it to two really matters a lot. Okay. So to me, first blood is as near to the platonic form because it doesn't allow for just like all of a sudden points go wild. Right. Um, The bad scenarios to me are the ones that use something more like the old scoring systems that have a random element that makes them sort of impossible to really understand what's going to be valuable and what's not. I'm looking at you, Veins of Gur. And uh, and or allow you to just suddenly rock it on points almost accidentally. Okay. Um, That's my thesis. Coach, I want to start with you, actually, because Tyler's going to get a talk a lot later. What do you think about what I just yeah. said? I do not disagree with anything you just said. Um, when I looked at those initial battle plans, and still to this day, they feel like transition battle plans. We mm-hmm. went from a way of playing Age of Sigmar in 2nd edition. We're moving to a way of 3rd edition. There's a lot of things that still got to come around and ways that you stratagems or you know battle tactics and things like that. And... And there are too many incentives right now to particular builds. Um, I've got some thoughts. I know when I was thinking about like, what does good look like? What does bad look like? And just some of those thoughts, it's just wild inconsistency right now. But I guess it also depends on what hat I'm wearing. Is it the tournament organizer hat, the match play person that wants to go, you know, podium or the average Joe? And I think depending on how you look at it will depend on how you see the current battle plans. But overall, I don't think they're they're that tight, and I think I'm curious to see what the next realm looks like. Well, yeah, the next battle pack. Sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, some of these bad battle plans really accentuate the issues of a less skilled player or a newer player against a slightly more seasoned player. Right. Um, when you look at veins of Gur, almost anybody can lose that accidentally. Okay. But a new player is going to be far more likely to accidentally lose that because they just don't understand how they need to sort of spread, cover, anticipate when the things drop, have things ready in position, set up their movements a turn or two in advance, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, You know, it's... uh, It just really occurs to me that, that the ones that are more even, it's almost harder for a skilled player to run up the score, Right? They can sort of like and, a great turn was, is they got six points because maybe they killed a monster or something, or they did about one of my points. Monster. Go ahead. Tells me one of my points is it's so easy to blow out the scores, and right. you know there's so many games that I'm watching that get blown out, and you can call it by round three, like you can just absolutely call it if that because the scores have gotten so big, objectives are being burnt, you know battle tactics have been denied, and you're not seeing and, and then you've obviously got battle plans that you know have the auto win conditions which are just sometimes too easy to 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 do so um i think it's just way too loose yeah absolutely oh, so yeah we're gonna talk about some I'm real not... offenders here in a moment but tyler what do you think what's your what's your overall your, your sort of summary well, that... take here yeah i just want to follow up on coach's point there i mean i we're we've always had an issue with the double to you know, the, the double in round two. So that's always been with us. I, I do think it is particularly pronounced right now with the damage output that many armies can do, where many games are just turning on that round two. So you're a Signs of the Storm, one drop, or you're Living Cities, and you put your dragons and your Fulminators off board, 
and you give away the turn, and then you come in bottom of one, and then you have top of two, and you've done so much damage that your opponent, you know, there's that's that pattern has always been with us, but it's very pronounced right now. So I, I would I would tend to start with that, like even setting the missions aside. I think that we've got a number of units that need to get reined in a little bit to help with that issue. Um, I'd love to get into some discussion around some of these battle plans that I think are widely viewed as poor battle plans, and just to try to give you know the steel man take you know a counter take on them and to see how it comes out. So veins of Gur, boots and nail, apex predators, those three in particular come to mind. Even a little bit on savage gains. Oh, I would add in marking in general, territory though, to that list or power in numbers. Like there's, territory. I got a list of like bad that's that pretty is, long. There's a number. <laughs> Yeah. Back to the show that you you guys did around ranking, you know, the the battle plans, and you know, if, uh, if we asked this two years ago, three years ago, you'd still have a quality high. You know, these are the good battle plans, and there's a couple that I don't recommend. But your show, you had majority don't recommend here is like five or six that we would actually use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Go ahead, Tyler, please. Yeah. Yeah. I, I suspect that holds up pretty well the but yeah, i do agree in general that there's some gaps in the current battle plans that i have favored personally the more standardized scoring and the differential scoring battle plans i do think there's something to be said with some of these i'm still not entirely you know like Sav savage gains we've had quite a bit of conversation around savage gains i know a lot of people who still consider savage gains one of the best battle plans out there. They love playing it, even with that fact change. So if anybody doesn't know, Savage Gains, the way it works now, is the way that Border War, Battle for the Past, always used to work, where you would score one point for your objective, you could potentially get four points for the objective in your opponent's territory, or boarding your territory now, and then two points each for the two middle. So there's potentially nine points available, plus the battle tactic. A lot of points. You know, that's yep. a potential major differential. We, we had been playing it for a while, many of us, to where we read it in the way where it was any objective in the middle, meaning that you could only do a max of two points, even if you control both. Right. So I, I'd love to get a little bit of discussion around that. You know, I'm not sure personally, and that will come into play with Coda because we did have Battle for the Pass as one that we wanted to bring back, because that was one of the true classics of Age of Sigmar's history. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like my hit list here, and again, I'm not, I'm not ranking these out, but I can summarize. Let's let's talk about the bad ones and what makes them bad. Like, let's let's talk about what makes a scenario sort of bad. And we, if we want to steel man them on the defensive, we can as well. All the things I would pick for my like scenarios that I would never want to see at a tournament goes something like this: marking territory, too easy to accidentally lose. Like it's just it's crazy to me that it also has this weird thing going on of where battle tactics are a thing now, like the number of battle tactics you complete is suddenly very important. And so nothing like the game accidentally ending in the third turn and just being like, well, the game's over. That's it. You don't get to your other battle tactics. So pff, sorry about your luck. Yeah, that's strange. Um, and so like I, I just I hate marking territory. Marking territory would be fine if. Seismic shift didn't exist. Or it'd be more fine. I shouldn't say that. It would move from like truly awful to average. That's what I mean. Seismic shift, the the removal of the objective, is such a big deal in some and how it impacts some of these scenarios and not others. And not just because of prime objectives, right? But just because of the nature of how it plays. Like it can flip to three, and because of the nature of how the objective get removed and when it checks, right, for for who won, it's just like it tick to three. Priority is this. I win. Um, That's it. I have I have seen some players. So Season of War, for example, they actually play it on their channel. So Vince, you and I were talking about this to where, let's say that happens. So let's say Ridge and Jordan are playing and Ridge wins the roll for round three. Ridge decides to go second and he burns one of the three objectives. Jordan, the way that they do it, will have the game doesn't end immediately because Ridge right now is controlling the other three. Jordan will have a shot at getting one of those objectives under his control, meaning they'll rule it to where you have you check at the end of the first turn 
sure. like round three as opposed to immediately. So it gives a little bit of leeway for the player. Which would, first. again, I like. I love that interpretation. That would also take a step toward making it better. As it is right now, played sort of by book, it's just, it is it is garbage. I have no better words for it. Okay, I, I do not like this scenario, and I think yeah. it's just a trap. Like, the number of people who are going to lose in that scenario and have a terrible time and not know they were about to lose is way too high. It's fine. It's fine if you are playing at your local game store because then I can go home, I can go to do some shopping. But when you're at a tournament and I now have to kill an hour, an hour and a half, just walking around and then it's going into lunch, you know, it's a really bad experience for a competitive point of view. And there's obviously a lot of other things to talk about, but um, that's probably like one of the hats that I've been putting on lately, being a tournament organizer and doing doing events is what is the experience that I'm trying to create? And that obviously leads a lot into randomness and the types of battle plans and the types of incentives. Uh, and I know when I was thinking about some that have like no reserves, I don't really don't like that either. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Ab well, absolutely. Because it, doesn't, because, because it doesn't, doesn't, there's no other incentives against like shooting armies. Like where's the fog of war where shooting armies can't shoot um, oh, 100%. You know, outside of a certain distance. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to punish, you know, people coming in from reserve, which is literally their allegiance ability. Well, then there should be other battle plans where we punish other abilities. Yeah, I want you to steel man tooth and nail for me, Tyler. Go ahead. I'm, like, I'm, I'm fascinated. I can't steel I mean, it's, man this. It's, it's another one that I think is just utter, utter, utter worthless trash. But go ahead. Get, what's the defense of this? Well, so part of it isn't necessarily my view on it. It's more of course. from what I have heard from quite a few others out there, uh, you know, experienced tournament players who will tell me about their local meta, their experience at tournaments that have played this. And so some of the views that I've heard, one is that deep striking is common in a number of metas that are out there. You know, sure. A lot of our factions nowadays, they have, you know, I think traditionally when we thought about Total Commitment was the prior version of this, we would tend to think about Stormcast and Nighthaunt. So why would you do this when it's these two armies, this is a core part of their allegiance abilities, that's kind of part of the argument. Now it's all over the place, this deep striking, and you have long There's strikes, more of it, but let's be reasonable. Certainly there are a lot that don't, but yes, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fire Slayers. I mean, it's, it's a size, I actually went through, it's a sizable list, right? So sure. that's... That is part of it, I would say, that there there's a pattern of a number of lists that are leaning into this play style uh, and that this would serve as a clear interruption of that play style. Fair point. Okay, good, good defense. Here is my counter. A lot of those other armies, it's not an allegiance ability. It's the choice of a unit. So all that's going to make those armies do is pick a different unit. Right? They didn't need to build their list to deep strike, whereas some armies have it as an allegiance ability and clearly rely on it as part of their thing. And I'm not even going to talk about Stormcast, because Stormcast are generally in a pretty great place right now. right? But um, my, my real problem with Tooth and Nail, it also has now, they added more things it screws up, like when stuff gets summoned or whatever, it can't charge or shoot or, or whatever nonsense. Okay, cool. Um, what's the best strategy in AOS right now? If you want, like, one of the best strategies, if you if you're trying to win games of AOS, what type of unit do you almost certainly have in your army? Power projection units. Right, ranged mortal wound dealers, right, of some variety, uh, or I guess just like a hundred and billion shots from a Namardi. <laughs> so just a lot of power <laughs> projection in that way, but. But like shooting, range shooting, right? Okay, what's one of the best defenses against being alpha struck by a range shooting army, all of which are the top of the meta right now? <laughs> sure, being off the board. Being off the board, not existing at that moment, right? Great, let's take that away. Like, let's make the most powerful forms of lists even more powerful, okay? Like, the alpha drop claim of what it's stopping Nobody's that scared of melee units dropping at nine inches and then potentially charging. That's not the fear, right? I mean, outside of Living City where they get to cheat, right? The fear is you drop a bunch of bow snakes, like, or not bow snakes is a bad example. You drop a bunch of uh, 15 judicators. Sure, let's go with that. I don't care. Pick mm -hmm. your thing, right? And they don't care that they're nine inches away. They might even set up farther than nine inches away. They're just setting up in range, right? 
So the problem's not the 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 deep striking. The problem is the same thing it's been. The 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 overwhelmingly powerful ranged mortal wound power projection. Right? You you like you mentioned salamanders. Great. That's another example, right? Like, yeah, Hearthguard can do it or whatever. Okay, roll a nine, man. If you get that nine, congratulations, you did it. Most armies can now get to a melee point where if they just run forward or have some ability to run and charge or move forward, they can often get less than a nine inch charge to get into melee anyways. Right, right. Yeah, man, I, I hard agree. You know, the main arguments that I've heard, they're symptoms, they're not addressing the root causes you know root causes uh yeah are the power projection one drop I, you know there's i'm yep. actually curious your guys current view on the one drops you know we, we've had some conversation for a little while now about is this really an issue in the meta and uh, you know i feel like the argument's getting stronger as the months tick by sure yeah i mean it's it's a bit sideways but yeah i agree it, it is <laughs> it is a problem just in terms of root, root issues that need to be yeah. addressed not looking for a battle plan like tooth and nail to try to address these root issues yeah it's the perfect storm of the combination like when you look at battle regiment on its own it's fine mm -hmm. like one drop cool who cares but when you start then adding in a whole bunch of things like the pure power projection being able to um you know burn objectives and you know could really could dominate those first couple of rounds knowing that um, the game is really owned right now in those first, really, by like round two, round three, in a lot of games, you can predict where it's going and, you know, who's going to win. Um, it's that perfect storm where it really asks you the question, you know, is, is this particular problem or is it the whole incentive structure to what you're saying, Tyler? So, yeah, I would agree when you start looking at all of the incentives together and what do we want from the game and mm -hmm. how we, what are the controls that we have to, um, to rein in certain elements because points is not enough. You know, we saw yeah. bow snakes, lumineth. You know, things go up. Cool. I just drop something else to keep my fifteen bow snakes to keep my thirty mm. sentinels. Um, so points is not the guardrail that we all think it's going to be. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and and also, yeah, I mean, yes, it's a problem, but but it's an inequitously distributed problem. Is anyone afraid of a one drop gets list? You, you roll sure. up to your opponent and there's a gets player at the table. They have a one drop list. Are you like, oh no? No, you're like, okay, cool. That's fine. <laughs> right. Great. You're one drop. All right. Yeah. Who's, you, you have priority, I guess. You know, like, fine. Mm -hmm. But you roll up and you, you face like the one drop Stormcast or one drop Lumineth or one drop whatever list. Totally different feeling in your gut. Right? And what that tells you oh. is there's something else at the root of it. Right? That That's it. So, um, okay. To me, then, what we've what we've said here about what makes these things bad is marking territory is bad because it interacts very poorly with the with seismic shift, the, the existing season rules, mm -hmm. right? And is very and, and has very poor timing into how points are, or how the win is determined. I really like your point about battle tactics, Vince. I actually hadn't thought about that because a number of tournaments, you know, coach. I'm not sure how you were planning to do Sydney GT. We've seen a number of tournaments that are using battle tactics as separate scoring in terms of like a victory point system, you know, where you might get X number of points if you get a major victory. And then if you got, you'll get like a point per battle tactic. Right. You could get up to say 15 points. Well, yeah, this could potentially screw you, you know, if uh, out of getting a battle tactic. So I, I hadn't thought about that before. And it's funny you say that because, you know, I've had some good chats with, you know, I've got a TO community, you know, in my server. And we talk a lot about, you know, in, event incentives and how you think about it. And you're just going to look at, like, the Warhammer Open and, you know, the way that they were incentivizing, like, win-loss and, you know, who, who was at the top of the ladder. One of them was based on the amount of victory points you scored. And I think one of the five was one of those 1-0 and o kind of battle plans. So if I can only score one, one point or no points, okay, cool, I got one point. But if I had a scenario previously where I'd rack up 20 30 40 and have right. an absolute blowout you can't catch mm. up so from a standardization point of view and how we and i know you had a really good chat with uh colonel cabbage a few you know a few months ago about tos and how we do differential and things like that i think that's where we got to look at the incentives as well to see how do we how do we incentivize outside win lose and draw you know and just keep adding on as as we get bigger and bigger and bigger 
if top players are all going five and zero oh with their um their their battles, they're then going five and oh, they're they're getting all five battle tactics. They're clearly a grand strategy. How do you cut? How do you cut up the top outside of like strength of schedule? You don't want to add just another layer of complexity. Um, so I think it's it's some interesting things to think about as we progress through um, this new version of Age of Sigmar. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Absolutely. All right. My next one on my hit list is Veins of Gur. I've mentioned it a few times already. I'll 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 tear this one down very easily. It's not hard at all to accidentally lose this game because all of the things drop on the wrong side or in the wrong place where your army is not and their army is and the reality is they will just suddenly own them right like the second one drops on the right side they're mainly mainly on the left they're screwed until the next until until round three happens and Mm -hmm. then boop boop they both fall on the left and they go cool and they just arrange their whole army in rows of chaff and and anvils that you're going to get through and it's gonna be like good luck good luck punching through in time you know, like I'm just going to win this. Okay. So have you ever like obviously we've had yeah. You we've had many variations of this going dating back to what was the original I can't remember what the original was called back in. Well, give, give from yeah, the yeah that's what it was. Which, which is heavens. funny because I really enjoy randomness. Tyler, please mm. like please continue your point. But I, I Well I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. So you so you so you, you okay, well curious your your views in a minute. So Vince, have you ever liked any of the iterations that we've seen over the years of this? The only the one I liked more was the one that almost forced them more into a tighter area in the middle, which I think was the last like mm-hmm. in AOS two point It was like you it was like on a one two it's here and three four it's here and five you know something like that. Like it had more than just three uh-huh. points, right? And it squished them all toward the middle, where statistically they were highly likely to be in the middle. The current iteration, there's only a 16% chance, roughly, that any one of them ends up in the middle. So they, they're they very prone to end up on the left or right side, because it's like 1 through 6, 7, 8 through 12, right, is how that's the, the board is broken up. So in this case, one, it almost... Yeah, go ahead. Modification would be 4, 3, 4, 2 through 5, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah, 2 through 5 the left side six through eight middle nine through 12 on the right how much does that improve things so in terms of the I, I need to look at like the any dice 2d6 to remember exactly what the okay. aggregate percentage chances are of all of those together but like you could it would help some if it was more forced towards a middle line okay but honestly it would just be cooler if they kind of just came down in a place <laughs> like mm. Boom, boom, boom. This They drop on the vertical. If it looked like First Blood that's on the screen right now, right? Mm-hmm. But it was like, round two drops here. Like, almost set the thing up exactly the same. Like, imagine if First Blood, or sorry, if uh, Veins of Gert looked like this. And if the round two drop was the center point, and then the round three drop were those two on the sides. And you just knew that's how it was going to mm-hmm. go. And this was the deployment for it. Right. That's a more interesting scenario immediately to me, because now people can actually start like thinking, strategizing, trying to make some decisions and not suddenly like, oh, I tried to make the best decisions I could to spread out to cover the most space. But then, oops, oops, all berries. <laughs> right. Um, um, like, you know, I, uh, assistant ref said you could roll for where the objectives come down before the game starts. So, you know, sure, that'd be fine, too. Like, I, you know, yeah, that's fine. I don't, I don't hate that either. So like it, there's still some randomness, but it's a decision you're making with knowledge in the game. I just think, yes, it often might be the case with veins that it doesn't work out like that, but it's a pretty sizable percentage time that it just like sucks (laughs) that it just doesn't, it's pretty easy. It's not exactly a low percentage chance to roll an eight or more twice in a row. Like, that's not a super low chance for that to occur, right? Or or a six or less. And if you don't happen to really have presence on that side of the board, because your army can't t- cover the whole board, right? It's just not it's just not how things work. If you do, you probably already lost because you spread yourself too thin, mm. right? So like this is the this is this is my my challenge with it. So my my third point would be overt randomness. Is a, is a for for no real benefit. Like why? What's the game? What is the actual gain? 
What is the justified thoughts, but, point? Yeah. What are your, before I get into a few more thoughts, what are your thoughts on veins of Gur and kind of this topic in general, randomness? And... It depends on what hat you're wearing, I think, oh. ultimately, right? If I am uh, at a tournament and I want to do well, I hate this scenario. I just hate mm -hmm. it because I don't like randomness and I like predictability. If I'm going mm -hmm. to win or lose the game, I don't want to lose it on a priority roll. And now this is another excuse of, oh, if only the objective landed on where my force was as opposed to completely. Um, there's been plenty of times where I've played this or an equivalent and the objective has landed in perfectly with, for my opponent. And literally yeah. there's very little I can do to scramble from one side to the other. But there's also yeah. been times where it's kind of gone in the middle or in, in my favor. If I am in the middle tables and I enjoy randomness and I enjoy the the um, the, the ability to counterplay to go well, I, I'm open to where it drops and then it's the mad scramble and then you know the unpredictability. And we've had we've had plenty of scenarios like this. We had um, was it what was that what was the one that we danced around the middle like in second edition? Was it um, uh, relocating all? Yeah, we've, had, yeah. we've had we've, we've had a whole bunch of those and some people like it but i think the vast majority do not like the unpredictability so i think season of war also made a really good comment i think the scoring mm -hmm. structure is also weird like just stick with one two and more as opposed to having right right a bunch of randomness thank you yeah that's a bunch of different excellent feeding. point the scoring structure on it is also bonkers much. bonkers yeah i don't i don't know guys like We've had this, I mean, I can, I get that view on the other side. We've had that scoring structure with this mission template for what I think since 2017, we've had this where they predicated on the battle round and the number of objectives, meaning there's 15 points available in round three. I've always liked that a lot, actually, because it was the one mission that opened up more space, I would say, for the long game planning and orienting toward, orienting toward the long game, toward round five and coming back at round five. Now that's biased on how I like to play the game, where I tend to like to play list you know, from a social contract point of view that kind of lean into that structure where you're not DPS checking your opponent off the table in round two. But anyhow, I, that's been my experience of Star Strike slash Veins of Gur is that I think it, that's, that's been a great structure in my view. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying. Yo, yo, Coach, what do you got? Hit me. I'll, I'll throw a hypothetical question. So the first objective in Reigns, Veins of Gur drops in Battle Round 2, and then this, the, this, the other ones drop in Battle Round 3. What if it was incentivized and brought forward around? So let's say the first one drops after deployment before the first Battle Round commences. So it's much earlier in the game, which means you've got much more time to go fight for the objectives with your bodies as opposed to two turns of moving one way and then you got to scoot 180 to go mm. the other way um uh, it's, it's, it's a hypothetical as opposed to um like what as is the root problem of these types of things is it the objectives come too late and you know it takes me too long because my army's too slow or is it the randomness yeah it's yes is my answer because that's you just got to exactly the point i wanted to get to coach which is tyler i appreciate that late game concept and i and i you know assistant rev mentioned that it's the, it's the comeback ideal and i appreciate the 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 ideal of the platonic form of this game but what actually happens is they end up holding like in the bad situation which is quite prevalent they end up holding two in round three probably two in round four. Maybe they lose one in round five by the time you get over there, but because they've still got one slash two of them, it doesn't matter. You can't catch up enough. They blew too far ahead of you because you held, you got like some one pointers and two pointers and they ran the score way up. Right. And you can just yeah. math it out. You can just math it out and go, you're going to get that yeah. one. I don't care. I'll literally just abandon it. So I lose nothing. I'll steel man my one point. Right. Yeah. And I win. I just insta win. So it doesn't matter. We've arrived at the same place, right? The second thing I'll say is that this game is already highly incentivized to favor extremely mobile armies and to de and and to like make it so things like gets or hordes of goblins are not a good play. There's already lots of reasons why those things are true. Okay, 
making it so little foot slogging troops that need to move in tight coherency in a big horde or something like that now have to run from this side of the board to the other that is a massive massive effort for them like you might as well just say those armies don't get to play if it comes down the wrong side because they'll never get there like sure if you're playing all dra like if you're all if you're oops all dragons and it drops on the wrong side you're like hey yolo hero phase move everybody hero phase move let's do this wow and we're across yeah. the board and breathing fire. Wow! You know, like, what a great day. Uh -huh. Yes, let's make dragons and super highly mobile armies that are already dominating even better again. Like, because that's what it does. Yeah. Right? It it does nothing to... to it, it only... That kind of a thing only further hurts slow armies that are already in a bad place in the meta and makes it even worse. Now, the only upside I have is that it is harder for Suns to win this this one because they just can't go stand on a thing mm. <laughs> so but that's because sons are designed poorly right like that's that's my answer there that's interesting with them yeah because it gives you more time theoretically at least uh i would think i don't know you have to play that i haven't played sons that much but potentially it gives more armies more time to pass the dps check as opposed to correct they don't, they don't have the time to do it but yeah coach <laughs> <laughs> To the teachers. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> uh, just the poor internet in Australia. I don't want to you know, keep interrupting you, you all. Another, another hypothetical question for you and probably the people in the chat is how much of this is created because of the Gurish Heartlands? Because we do have a monster hero meta right now. Sure. And it's heavily skewed in a certain way and there's more things rewarding those types of people. And I know when I, you know, when Games Workshop is kind enough to send me documents in advance, um, I'll look at them and I think like, right, this is how they act right now. But what does it look like three months from now or six months ago in in, in now for GBH twenty two? Right. Let's say hypothetically the the Gurish Heartlands is no longer there and we're in a wizard meta or we're in a um, horde meta or an artillery meta. Who knows? But how many of these problems are coming from the monster incentives? which are mobile, which are doing mortal wounds, which are doing these things that the meta is kind of creating. And I wonder if you just remove that one element from the, the jigsaw, what would change? So and if, are these problems still a problem? I think it has a huge impact. I agree with you. Like part of it is the weird victory point run up that can happen by overscoring on battle plans and overscoring on on you know sort of monsters doing things and or killing monsters they're a little more constrained they only tend to be points around the margin the problem is in some of the the they matter the most in the tight battle plans where the the scoring does remain relatively evenly right so in those situations in in the tight battle plans the 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 gurish sort of rules actually matter quite a bit right and so it does encourage you highly to have a monster in the in the blowout ones, like, who cares? Oh, you got an extra point for killing my monster? Like, congratulations, man. I, I scored, like, a million more points than you this round. So I guess, like, good job. <laughs> you know, I made five extra points this round over you. You got one. It's like, okay. Cool. Right, you know. Um, so, the... All right, let's... I want to move on because I do want to give plenty of time to War Coda. So... The the other ones that that to me are fall in like the bad category are stuff where their rules are just very much misaligned with the with the the current state of the meta or the game in in a real hard way. So this would be your apex predators, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, you know where it's just no, we don't need to further incentivize ultra powerful heroes. That's we got that covered. We're good. Ultra powerful heroes are are already fine. Um, in an arm in a safe stacking meta, etc. Things like apex predators is just. It's, that's a, that's a no that's a no go for me. That's a no go. I've talked this before about how Archeon, Nagash, they still have to all this, you, You've got to have a, a leader hanging out on that point to keep scoring it. Yep. So you know you can you can certainly find yourself in a situation where oh Nagash is going to continue hanging out here because I don't have another leader to come take his place. You know, that that will come up periodically. Uh, where so that limits what he's doing in a game, you know. So that's one drawback, one healthy balancing factor. I mean, I've actually played a lot of good games on Apex Predator. Surprisingly, like when I look at this on paper, my expectation is that this is a crap mission. That's mainly predicated on the what what's always made Apex Predator slash of arcane power, etc. That mission is power projection, is is shooting, 
And I, I do still think, in my mind, that's the main concern that I still have about this, is that with a lot of these armies, you shoot heroes off the board, then you go and score. But now your opponent might have power, you know, like in a situation where it's power projection versus power projection, well, whomever kills the other heroes first wins, you know, all that's equal, and they move on to the objectives. I mean, is that in your guys' mind still the main problem, fundamentally, with this mission, is range damage? Yeah. Or is it something else? I think it's yeah maybe maybe not i don't know i think it plays into it to me and it's not even necessarily by mm -hmm. the by about uh like range damage certainly matters it, it just matters too much not it m but my answer is it matters more because in the current meta we're not just talking about god models we're talking about the ability to walk anybody up and and a lot of them can just go to an almost bulletproof save Right, so if you don't have range yeah. power projection, you just lose because you put any old hero on a three up on the point, chaff them, yeah. and then be like, "Well, you never get this now." Like even if you have shooting, unless it's hardcore mortal wound shooting, you're yeah. not getting to me off of this, right? This, this, so yeah, the general this will come up as I, the major concern, the main concern, not so the major, but the main concern that I have with the game of heroes, which is our version of Total Conquest in War Coda. It is one that's oriented around uh, leaders slash heroes tied to leaders, so that excludes Gotrick. But yeah, is this issue? You know, we've got bodyguard rules. Uh, obviously, you can do screening and yeah, safe stacking. So there are a number of ways, yeah, that, that leaders can be fairly survivable on a mission where you're accumulating points. So, coach, what's been your experience with Apex Predators? See, I have always enjoyed these hero type of scenarios. We've had, uh, it was a duality of death back in the year, right. ye old days. We've had iterations of this. So at a, at a battle planned level, like ignoring the meta for a second, because I'm thinking about Games Workshop when they wrote this book and they wrote the General's Handbook. Did they want to speed up the monster hero meta and help us reduce the amount of chaff on the board to put points in? Because we, we are fundamentally moving towards more 40k where it's, less models on the table, more survivable on the table. Are we just trying to fast track that through the, the likes of God tier heroes? Or did they not expect the monster hero meta that we've got with the safe stacking, all the craziness? And because you've got to imagine that if they didn't anticipate it, they wouldn't have known what type of monster they're creating here. Because I like Apex Predator at a fundamental level. But yeah. then when you add in everything you've just talked about, you see that we're in for a bad time. Now, if you okay. change the mechanics of the game, I think we're okay again. Because if you rewound Warhammer Weekly years years previously, no one was whinging about duality of death. No, no one and was I, whinging about these types of scenarios. Totally agree. Totally agree. Well, Should have been, because it was a crap mission. I, I always <laughs> conceptually... <laughs> Uh, no, I agree with you. Conceptually, I like this mission. I, Coach, I, I'm dead on with you here. Like, conceptually, it's a cool idea of, like, the king of the hill, the the, the hero holds the point. Like, it's a, it's a sweet idea, right? And it should be doable. It just feels like the, as you said, all the other stuff put on top of this is making this. Like, Marathi's very existence almost makes this a very bad time. Just by her, that one war scroll. Right. As long as she's I'm holding on to the Ironheart cane. I'm, 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 a mega gargant, like you know, I, I'm building a list for this tournament. I've yeah. made one of my megas a 40 wound mega. Okay, cool. Like it's gonna sit there. It's gonna sit there for a long time. So uh, it's just unfortunately the incentives right now just make it a really bad time. But fast forward 12 months from now, it's actually could be a really good one. Yeah, I'll be yeah. interested to see I, the the iterations of these in 2022. Okay, go ahead, Tal. I was just going to say, my honest answer is I don't have enough experience with this mission. Uh, we're going to be playing it next month at one day or locally gets more experience. I would love to hear comments, just in general, folks' experience, especially at tournaments you know, that have played this. Uh, I did play it at Gateway Open last year, and I did have Marathi. Marathi, if you're playing against someone who knows what you have to do, which obviously is chip off three damage, like, you can get off the board pretty quickly, guys, as we know. Sure. I mean, sure, I, sure. I get it conceptually that, that Marathi has an inherent advantage on paper, and and yet, yeah. So anyway, I, I did. I, I my huh? I was gonna say I, I do. I come from a position where I'm a potato, and I'm running around free guild guard on foot. I'm running around Scragger up the Loon King. Like I'm running around potato five wound, six wound heroes. Sure. Um, but certainly the incentives. <laughs> nah, just like, good luck getting <laughs> Scrag right within three inches of it. He's just die like that. Yeah, yeah. 
anyway, yep. th th I feel like there's more to say about Apex and that it may be better than meets the eye, but we'd, we'd love to hear some thoughts from others about it. Yeah. The final thing I'll mention is we have to be careful about how, before we move on, then I want to get into war code. Just the final thing I'll mention is that we have to be really careful about when scenarios encourage already bad behavior. So my example for this one is survival of the fittest. Okay. So survival of the fittest is, is the, the, the thing where you both pick three predators. Right. Hmm. Now, Again, conceptually, I have no issue with this mission. It's kind of silly to go through all this extra picking and stuff and blah, blah, blah. But it's fine. The issue with it is I'm going to give I'm going to now tell you two units. OK, and I want you both to tell me which one is the better predator. All right. Here is unit number one. Fulminators for they're both good units, by the way. Fulminators. Unit number two, long strikes. Who's the better predator? Obviously long strikes. Option yeah. B, my friend. Yeah, it's obviously oh. long strikes. Because the ability for your predator to kill the other predators at a distance is better than having to go chase them down in melee and kill them. Right? Like, it's right. not complicated <laughs> math when you can just sit there and be like, that predator, dead. There's a point for me. God forbid you picked a monster. There's oh. two points for me. Right? Next, um. pff, dead. Next, pff, dead now not only have i maxed points but you have no predators to speak of and cannot get those back right so if you're picking all melee predators against a person who has powerful shooting predators well enjoy your loss <laughs> like mm -hmm. it's almost instantaneous because they just have the easy ability to get the points whereas you have to go you have to physically go over them <laughs> to them Reminds me of the, the joke about the creation of the flamethrower. Like, yeah, I really like setting people on fire, but I don't like walking. If there was only some way I could just set some person on fire from from far away, if I could just throw fire at them somehow. You know, that's that's what it feels like. Um, so, anyways. Okay, cool. With that all out of the way, so we, we kind of understood what's good, what's bad, right? Like, what's making these good and bad. By the way, if people want a quick list, here would be my list of the things that I think are good tournament stuff let's do a quick check on this and get see what you guys think ready here's my tournament ready ish <clears throat> list <laughs> stuff that i might not love but i'm okay with seeing in a tournament so these run from like good to neutral in no particular order okay if you're a to by the way screenshot this screenshot this very moment <laughs> and give this to yeah. your to or your local game store because i've done this actually before but like oh what battle mm -hmm. plans like just do this pick from here yeah Savage Gains, First Blood, uh, Tectonic Interference, The Vice, Feral Foray. That's my five. Coach, what do you got right now? What would be your five? Uh, look, I don't, I don't have an opinion, mostly because I wanted to ask you a question then. Because, hmm. again, I'm going back to the ye old days where General's Handbook only had six battle plans. That's right, folks, who, who in first edition Age of Sigma, it was literally six battle plans, and you'd go to a tournament, and you'd be basically playing the same battle plans nonstop. So if people go around taking your list of ints, and we start seeing the same five at all the upcoming events, would you be happy with that? Or do you think we need a little bit of diversity coming from some of the others? Because I think for me, it comes down to what's the type of event you're trying to run. If you're running yeah. pure competition, I would agree with you. If you're trying to run something a bit more fun, a bit more flexible, you're worried about the middle tables, I think there's some things you pull in. Yeah, my answer is very simple. No, the, like those five are the only good ones worth using in a tournament. <laughs> okay. And but I but I do want variants, coach, because you're exactly right. I think that the problem is you don't want to just play the same five missions every game, every tournament, right? So, but but those are the only good five ones right now. What do we do, right? What could we possibly I do? A solution. Uh, yeah. Uh, Paul Wright, the reason I don't like Survival of the Fittest is because of the reasons I just said. It can run the score up in weird ways. Like, people can suddenly spike up, and it, 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 it only encourages the worst elements of the already existing overpowered meta the most powerful <laughs> units that currently dominate in the top armies are only better on survival of the fittest and all the weakest armies are only weaker 
So there you go. But other than that, yeah, sure. Um, I don't have that much of a problem with 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 um, power struggle. It's it's just weird I think to count, it's but solid. it's, it's yeah. fine enough. It would be my sixth. It'd be my on the cusp sixth. Okay, but what do we do? We don't have enough scenarios. Well, it sounds like we're going to need to get some more scenarios. Fortunately, boom, Tyler is here. <laughs> Tyler and a group of other uh, members of the community have resurrected, uh, play tested, and put together a some 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 favorite scenarios from the past. We're gonna bathe ourselves in the nostalgia of past scenarios, like the waters of Lake Minnetonka, and uh, and get into these. These are all available online. They are on AOS Shorts website. Uh, you can so you can go there and get the full detail. They all have the pretty art and everything like that um, for use in your Ew. games. What? Go ahead. AOSShorts.com. AOSShorts.com slash Warcoda. Yes, they are all. It's it's linked in the description. Okay. So just just click that link. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the uh, and and so. Tyler, before I get to the specific battle plans, now is the time where you're going to talk a lot. Why did sure. you do this? Other than what we just said, right? I mean, I think we just gave a long justification for why, and we'll evaluate yeah. your scenarios according to those things. But but, but why did you do this? <laughs> yeah, it's really good. I mean, the first reason was, obviously, a lot of us didn't get to play the General Sandbook 2020 battle plans, given what all was going on in the world. And, I mean, unfortunately, Coach, you still haven't been able to play many games hardly any games with 3.0 yet, but, you know... Tournaments, the, not, not games. Tournaments, tournaments. <laughs> there you go, fair enough. Uh, but we we had some amazing battle plans, really great battle plans. I, I think I remember we did a show, Vince, or maybe not, but saying that I thought that was the best GHP set of battle plans we had seen back in 2020. So that was the first motivation, you know, some good ones. And let's, but they were designed for a past edition. It's a very different edition now in many ways. And they, at least three of them in particular, needed to be updated, you know, a, a little bit. One was quite straightforward, Battle for the Pass. So, yeah, that, that was the main motivation. Nice. I love it. These, and look, Simple. we've got some really good uh, past battle plans. And I think that we throw them away too easily is my answer. Um, now, we obviously had to when we got to AOS 3 because the rules just changed so so dramatically, right? There was no other choice. So you resurrecting them and putting them onto the the 3.0 framework, I think is a fantastic idea. Let's take the core goodness of those, get the rules over to something, you know, in the right way round with what we've talked about makes a scenario good in 3.0. And let's get these because I've had a lot of good games on some of these scenarios that you, you included in here, right? Well, it's funny because 2020 I actually had an absolute cracking tournament season and I'm look, I'm re looking at the list and I'm like, yep, that was a great battle plan. That was a great <laughs> battle plan. Love total commitment, love blades edge, love places of arcane power, love, love, uh -huh. love. I'm looking at these going, yeah, these were great. Cause I was fortunate to play in those season where mm. I know some people weren't. So to, to bring um, that back is incredible. I, I, I can't wait for you to do chain Colossus, the ultimate best battle <laughs> plan ever created. Oh yes. man, you were always the biggest fan for that. Yeah. Let's I get some more. <laughs> the, the only problem with Chain Colossus, which was, I, you know what, Coach, I'm with you. I'd love that. I've played that scenario a bunch of times. The only problem with it was that it was too hard to wake him up. Like, it was really hard to get him awake and running because you had the number of objectives you had to control. Just, I want to see that again. As is a fun scenario, not a tournament scenario, but I want to see that again where it's way easier to wake up the purple sun. So, there you go. See, it was, it was really good when uh, no one took the purple sun because it was like 100 points. It was trash, yeah. you know, too hard. Then they dropped it to 50 points and everyone started taking their list. You're like, oh, I can't have Chain Colossus and people running around with purple sun. <laughs> so uh, that was my problem. All right. So Brian let's get into the specific ones here. Oh, what would you say? I'm sorry. Go ahead, Tyler. Uh, Brian, as you'll be happy to know that the project was called originally Battle Coda. Uh, I had mentioned on a show a number of episodes ago that we had to change the name. And yeah, I mean, it's not that uh, ingenious to stick Warhammer or War in front of the, the name. But if anybody's, I mean, Coda means essentially, I mean, it's got a different meanings, but it's kind of an addendum, a supplement, kind of like a concluding right. chapter, concluding piece, a musical piece. Yeah, it's so kind of had a, that, you know, that I thought really resonates with the, the idea here. I do like melee manuscript. It's solid. Okay. So yeah. here we go. <laughs> uh maybe maybe this is the lieutenant's handbook something like that 
<laughs> We're not, you're not a full-fledged no. general yet, Tyler. All right, here we go. Right. So uh, here's your first one I have on screen right now is a game of heroes. Let me see if I can make this a little bigger so we can all see it. There we go. Um, I'm going to shave the name off there just so we can all see what's going on. So a game of... I'm wondering, of, if, this is, I'm wondering if this is Tyler's um, Hinderlands equivalent, and we're going to see him as the new Sam Pearson riding for the Times Force. <laughs> I hope they're not upset by this. Like, hopefully, this will be. Will no, be they'll viewed steal it. They'll put it in the GBH twenty three. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah, this is no, you're just doing their work for them. That's... All right. Yeah, yeah. Hit me. Walk us through a game of heroes, okay? Uh, absolutely. All right. So the inspiration for this was Little Conquest. Conquest had a hero element where you would get a bonus victory point if you had a hero near an objective. That's essentially how it worked. And the, that was the starting point. And then, of course, the, we've had a lot of chatter, particularly on this show over the years, about how you have these small foot troops, that, or sorry, small foot heroes, that you know, tend to not really reflect what their narrative is, their lore is. Like, they're badasses that are almost never taken in a list, or you know, they're hard to fit in a list, Eltharian, Megaboss on foot, like a long history of these things. So part of the idea was what might it look like to have a mission that gave a clear reason to run a leader or two of nine wounds or less, be a clear benefit for doing that. That was the core idea behind it. Um, in terms of how this one works, while I'm talking about it, I'll mention the special victory point condition, which is score one victory point if you have a friendly leader from your starting army with a wounds characteristic of nine or less within three inches of any objective you control starts the game outside of your territory. Because obviously it wouldn't make sense to just allow you to get a free point for having a leader meeting those conditions on yours. Okay, so, and then on top of that, we have the regular hold one, hold two, hold more, and battle tactic. This is the only yep. special thing. Yep. And we, we had some different versions of this where, you know, in terms of like they're all prime objectives, got it down to doing prime objectives for the both players' territories. And we did that for a couple of reasons. Uh, you can burn in round three the other two. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the other two uh, on, the, on the ends there, the bottom left and, and upper right. Uh, guys good so far? Uh, good, very good so far. Okay, so we also... All right, so that's... Obviously, really, anytime you have a potential bonus point available somehow, some way, I mean, that can be a major incentive. And we were finding that there wasn't enough incentive to actually go after your opponent's objective mm -hmm. in their territory. Uh, there's a lot of play on the, on, the, on the upper right and lower left. And what we added was no middle ground to try to give a little more incentive to go after your opponent's objective, to kind of make that relevant. So that one is, if you control the objective, that starts the game wholly within your opponent's territory. The objective counts as two objectives when scoring victory points at the end of each turn. We've seen that with a few of these missions. I'm um, thinking about, I think, Rising Power. Out yes, of this, is a, this is a mechanic this. in the base core rules uh, battle plans, uh, like in the, in the core books, battle plans uses this mechanic that we don't see really pushed out into the GHB. And I don't know why it's a good mechanic because it's actually pulling double duty. Yes. It's incentivizing you to go after theirs, but it's also incentivizing them to protect theirs. Right. So they have to be more like, because otherwise they could just drive their whole army off into other places and kind of leave the home when undefended, just relying on the distance. If they knew you didn't have a teleport or a drop or a way to jump their lines. Right. But now that becomes a lot harder because if anything sneaks through, all of a sudden they're going to very, they're going to almost instantaneously overtake you on the score one, or hold one, hold two, hold more. So yeah, I love uh, it. Exactly. It has, yeah, it helps offset. It can, it can help offset seismic shift. It has, yeah, another nice elements. Too. So we're using, in terms of this map, this is just pulled directly from Total Conquest. Yeah. You know, and, and we're, I think this is a map that we've got on Apex Predators, I believe, actually, is using this as well, of, of our current crop. So really love this map. It does tend to 
incentivize more play across the board. We've had a lot of amazing games. So yeah, this has been, this one probably is the most unique, I would say. We actually renamed it because it didn't seem like the narrative, you know, Total Conquest really tells you about what this one is supposed to entail. And then, you know, there's kind of an obvious, not so clever reference to Game of Thrones with the name here of uh, Game of Heroes, including the, the no middle ground based on the original quotes. So, yeah, uh, one other thing I want to say about this in terms of a concern, you know, all of these we're really looking for feedback as folks try them, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, we did spend uh, four solid months playtesting these things. We had multiple one dares. A uh, quick shout out to the Queen City Sigmar group in Missouri. Uh, Constantino Kellis in Sweden, Jeff Nauman and the St. Louis crew and other one day events, uh, just an, a large number of uh, people were involved in this project giving us feedback. But the main concern that I still have with this mission comes down to what we were talking about earlier with sort of the inherent potential challenge of these leader missions. Let's think about, let's say Vince, you're playing Soul Black Grave Lords mm -hmm. and you go first and you put, obviously you put a grave site uh, probably on both of the bottom left and the upper right objectives. And you put a necromancer on the line, let's say on the top right, and you maybe auto run that necromancer, which will get you within three inches of that upper right objective. Cool, you've got that condition met. And then of course you bring up 60 zombies from the grave that's gonna benefit, that necromancer is gonna benefit from the bodyguard rule of a three plus shrug, you know, to help keep them alive. So oh, I could see situations like that, you know, maybe leading to some imbalances in some games. So that was the main concern that I have at the moment. But what are you guys' thoughts? I'm going to say yes, two coach. things. First off, it reminds me a lot of um, one of my favorite scenarios, even though battle plans, even though I said I hate auto wins, um, yeah. Knife to the Heart was one that I always really enjoyed because you couldn't bring your whole force to your opponent's objective. It was that I've got to leave some troops and go attack with some troops and always like how much was always a an interesting conundrum the other part though and then potentially the challenge that we've all just complained about throughout this episode is that we have a lot of immortal wound character sniping troops out there at the moment and does this mm -hmm. incentivize that behavior even further to pop mm -hmm. those little nine wound heroes and then go rack up some extra vp yeah yeah it might yeah i on that on that point, coach. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if this is meaningfully contributing too much in that regard, because it at least putting some potential benefit on the table. Let's say before those heroes die, uh, there are a number of those heroes uh, lists that have ways to offset some of that damage, where they, maybe they're not dying immediately. You know, so where you would have a chance to at least get some extra points before they they fall off the you know fall off the table and uh, get killed. The yeah, reason, the reason I thoughts. think about that was just because, mm -hmm. like, when I played Daughters of Cain um, in AOS 3, I was trying to not build the snake. You know, people have heard me whinge about it. You know, I tried to do witch elves with, uh, without, uh, without the, um, the snakes. And I'd run a lot of witch elves with um, little foot troop um, hag queens and, and slaughter mm -hmm. queens and things like that. And, I, and as much as I wanted to pick um, Pillars of Faith as a grand strategy, I didn't want to incentivize my opponent to focus on these fragile support heroes that offered me so much. So I think for me, like I really love the concept, but I worry that as well, if I was playing it, I'm just further enhancing. I, I need you to avoid touching those five wound heroes. So sure. Yeah, we, we define that a number of games where that's part of the I think the issue is that a lot of the times you only find these nine wounds or less heroes as support heroes. Their asses are hanging out in the backfield and that's all that they're doing. Whereas with a number of those heroes this gives you a reason maybe a necessity to compete on the mission to actually get them in harm's way or to run someone that could actually maybe survive in harm's way on an objective that was also partly why what incentivized doing three inches of the objective which you know is pretty standardized for some of these missions over the years like apex predators is three inches place of arcane power was three inches as opposed to six inches which obviously would just allow you to do a you know tiptoe in and then you're you're pretty far away you've got a screen a couple of screens whatever but yeah we did find in a number of games that you know a lot of these lists that have support heroes it did give you real reason to have to maybe put your Hag Queen in harm's way, your Branch Wraith, your Warsong Revenant. You know, sorry, you're not just going to hang out and do your Mortal Wound Bomb. You may actually need to get your Warsong Revenant in the fight to get that bonus point, which I thought that was pretty cool. Yep. 
No, I like it a lot. And just to clarify, you get a maximum of one. Like, if I have a hero within two points, I get one point yes. still, right? Because it's if within any. You're using the any term, but we're, we're reading this correctly, which is the right limit. That is correct. So I'm not over-incentivized to have heroes spread out and take everything. It's still only worth one point. It's constrained. I actually really like this one a lot, Tyler, is, is my honest feedback. It incentivizes things that are on the weaker side now. Uh, which is the nine wound or less heroes uh, being used in an interesting way. And it's different from things like Apex Predators because it's not holding and controlling the point. It's just a bonus, right? It doesn't stop me. Like, his presence doesn't stop. I can still take the point away from you if that dude's within three inches, right? Totally. It's just adding as a small bonus. So, yes, I like this quite a bit. I like the no middle ground. I like the incentive on the other hero. I really like this setup. That is to say, the square against the square with the two other corners. Like, just as a deployment, I quite like this setup. I think it's a really good setup in the way it moves, forces kind of your armies to move around and make a decision. I mean, what tends to happen in these is the is the, the whirlpool, right? Like, armies tend to sort of rotate around each other. But then, no, middle ground is kind of also helping to stop that, right? So, because the the normal thing that happens when this goes is every the, both the armies just go like this and rotate around each other. But you can't do that, obviously, uh, if you're going to give up the the game by, by you know, rotating away from your point. So, yeah, I'm wet. I'm with it. I'm with it. All right, let's keep moving. I didn't. I didn't even say oh, you're obviously you're nine off the center point. Yeah. So yeah, yes, we've we got a lot of missions like that. But just to say it, yeah. Yep. I saw somebody had a cool game aid this weekend that was like uh an arrow like a sort of arrow at a right angle on a stick that then had a half moon on the bottom and it was that the, the oh. edge of the half moon was nine inches so you just measured out the center point and then you set that down and that's your deployment line it's like that is the greatest game aid i've ever seen uh, because measuring on all the uh, all the diagonals where they meet each other and you've got a bunch of nine inches away is super annoying yet another reason to uh, hate survival uh, of the fittest uh okay <laughs> Next up, uh, Battle for the Pass. Uh, our old lengthways sort of situation with the two in the middle. Uh, talk to me about Battle for the Pass. Uh, Coach, did you like this one back in the day? Mm, yes and no. Huh? Yes, because it was a great battle plan. No, because at the time, tournaments were all about putting you as close, as many people oh, in the room yeah. as possible. <laughs> And tables right. were always connected. So to play with it, it was yeah. so awkward. And I was yeah. literally just thinking about this going in this COVID world right now where tables are more spread out, would there be more space to be able to move around the table and play this game? And I think that's where if you create the space, awesome. If you are uh, rows and you're trying to play a game like reaching over, it's just, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Here, like here's your issue. Like it's, you, you're not creating that environment, but it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, okay. my ask, please keep the tables like this always, TOs of the world. I understand that you have to make your money back. I will happily, you can up your ticket price if it means covering the other people who aren't there, if it means we get to have the space. I would much rather have a more generous amount of space to set some stuff on the side of the, pla of the mat, put my dead figures, put my stuff in reserve, have maybe my book or things off to the side, not be shoulder to shoulder with everybody or butt to butt. Uh, if it means I have to pay like $20 more for the weekend, I will happily pay that every time because my goodness, is it a better experience? So yes. All right. Take us through battle for the past. Totally. While I'm thinking about it, I do uh, just two more names to mention. Uh, Andy, Andy Long, he's designed a lot of the amazing, you know, graphical assets, tokens, and so on. Uh, a lot of worked with Dan, a lot of Davis shorts. Andy did the design for this. So thank you, Andy. And then Travis uh, Boyson, good friends from the Queen City Group. Travis was uh, my chief partner in crime with this project. So thank you, Travis, for everything. Okay, so Battle for the Pass. Yeah, I mean, this is one of the absolute classics. And it was the most straightforward to translate of all four, by far. Uh, the main question was, so just to say it, basically this works the exact same way as Savage Gains, except we did go the other way on that fact question. But just to spell it out, if anybody doesn't know, so we've got two prime objectives in this one. Uh, objectives that border the player's territories are the prime objectives. So in round three, you could burn one of the two in the middle. All right, and then traditional scoring structure, 
uh, score one. We, we talked about it earlier. So everybody, pretty much everybody knows about the path scoring structure. Oh, one thing to point out. All right, what, the main actual change I would say that we made universally with these battle plans relative to GHB twenty one was it did not have any language in the GHB twenty one battle plans that would mitigate confusion and I would say weird consequences around get off me land the objective kicking sure yeah, yeah. Of sons of behemoth now i got asked a lot of people their thoughts on this because it's a sizable change particularly if you're a sons player you may not like this what we did was and i'd be curious coach your view on this no what we no, did no, no, no. I, I think you're underestimating what i'm about to say but go on okay all right fair enough my friend so give you an example of it's a simple change so let's take the arguably one of the biggest uh, benefits to Suns on Savage Games was, so this score one, one victory point if you control the objective that starts the game. Well, how I wrote it is score one victory point if you control the objective that starts the game on the board of your territory. They did not have the start the game language in Savage Games. So of course, yep. you just kick that one pointer into the middle or God forbid into your opponent's territory to rack up more points and savage games can get out of control in my experience pretty quickly when it comes to sons of bay and that kicking objectives around so we just decided to tether objectives to where they are at the start of the game to minimize this stuff we've been drilling on that before i keep going on what are your guys thoughts on that love it yeah love it i have oh, no more feedback for sydney. yeah one of my house <laughs> rules for sydney gt was actually you can't kick primaries I wanted to try that out. I wanted to see what it would look like if Gargans couldn't kick primaries. So um, yeah, I like it. I like it. It's a little bit of bookkeeping, but it's not major. Um, uh, and I think it probably way. is one of those feel bads, right? Like it's as a as an opponent to a Suns player, there's literally nothing I can do to stop you from uh, changing the points of an objective. And people dislike the ability. It's why people hate Sentinel shooting off the hero because there's literally um, nothing I can do to stop you. So that is another great example that community would go, yep, yeah, I'm, I'm down with yeah. that. Yeah, it's I such an like elegant, first, simple change. I'm totally behind it. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like first principle view. I'm more, rather than even necessarily the impact, it's just in terms of like scoring and the ability of the Suns to win games, it's the confusion that I've seen it create right. in yep. 3.0 with players, particularly on some of these missions. Yeah, so, right. Uh, yeah, guys, I mean, other than that, this one is pretty... Standard, you know, standard fair, savage gains. Oh, the fact question. Yeah. So again, got a lot of opinions on how we should roll this. Should we just go with the way that they rolled it for savage gains, where you can get two points per middle if you control both for four points from the two middle, or do we cap it at two points? I did have some people who thought you should just stick with the fact. But I'd say two out of three people thought that we should actually revert back to the way many of us were playing it, where it's two points for any objective in the middle. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's how, and again, love feedback on that. If, if you think that's the wrong ruling, let us know. Let me know. But, yeah, that's the way it is right now. Yep. I mean, you know where I stand. It's absolutely the correct ruling. And they decided wrong in the GHB. And they should feel bad about it. <laughs> if anyone hasn't played Battle for the Past because they've come into, you know, the game in third edition... I'd highly recommend playing this particular one because it was a tournament um, standard. Like, people have run the Battle for the Pass since, like, day one. So, um, highly enjoyable battle plan. And I'm glad you brought it back. Yep. It, it just makes it much yeah. more tactically interesting to play like this. All right. It, we we know this one. We love this one. I think this is universally a winner. It's great. And and even though it does use an unusual soaring, scoring system, it's actually interesting how well the math breaks out to being the same. <laughs> Right, like the yeah. average play of this is still five points per round, when 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 it's set up correctly with the the FAQ going going the opposite direction, like you have it, so it actually does stay quite tight. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm with this. All right, focal points. Okay, take us through focal points. Um, yeah, so focal points. We've had it over. We've had three iterations over the years of so focal points. I think dating back to 2018. So we've had different deployment maps. Usually it was five objectives, so often you would have one in the middle, as well as this exact layout. So we started off with one in the middle, 
along with this layout. Uh, Vince, I'm actually looking at the screen. I'm guessing you got the battle plan maps on the screen. I do. Yep, I do. Okay, very good. Very good. So the left, uh, the west objective is number one, north objective number two, east objective number three, south objective number four. Okay. So a few core characteristics of focal points over the years. It incentivized play across the entire board. It incentivized you, you know, having a reason to go after, like if you're a you're coach, you're the defender, for you to go after your opponent's objectives. You got to cross quite a bit of ground, all less equal to potentially do that. And particularly to get the main special victory point condition that it's always had, where previously you would get, like in the 2020 version, Coach, if you'd held one and three, you'd get three points. You held two and four as well, you'd get another three points. So six point swing. Now we tried something, we've tried different versions of those differential scoring, uh, differential scoring orientation. It was the same pattern that we talked about earlier, guys. Like scoring just got out of control in too many games. Right. Yep. Something like that. Yep. We we kept wheeling it back, wheeling it back to where what we settled on for the again, it's a hold one, hold two, hold more, and battle tactic. And then the special, the single special victory point condition, score one victory point if you control objectives one and three, or two and four. So again, no doubling up. Yep. It's a max of one extra point being on the battlefield. Yep. Try doubling up. Welcome feedback on it from folks who are trying it. It wasn't quite working for us. That was one thing in terms of the iteration on this. Uh, these are all prime objectives felt that they had to all be prime objectives given the nature of how this mission works particularly with the special victory point condition yeah maybe that's something that maybe there's some debate around that and then finally the big one in my mind was so we were trying out first blood's deployment map i think generally about everybody's a fan of you know the three boxes the yep. little l we added a fourth right we added a fourth box yeah you went full tetris so we piece. added that upper right box Tetris piece, yeah. <laughs> so we were finding that there were too many games where, and because you're incentivized to get into your opponent's deployment all less equal, you know, go after that special, that, that bonus victory point, you, want to, you really want to incentivize that. It just, for some armies, it was too much ground to cover to do that sufficiently well. And right now, this is oriented it to where, let's say you're an Iron Jaws player. And your defender, you're deploying the defender's territory, you might your well, maybe not Iron Jaws player, because they, they can get where the hell they want to go anyway. But yeah, you're sure. you're planning to play aggressively. So you deploy in the upper right, right? You're you're 15 inches away from your opponents from that north objective, that number two objective. I mean, that's obviously really close. So your opponent has to be thinking about that, you know. But your opponent can do the same on the other side with the Tetris piece. Right. So we were we were we were finding it's it was an interesting in terms of kind of what the, there's a lot of deployment space. You can play aggressively. You can play conservatively. There's not a lot of extra scoring. Coach, I'm going to shut up and let you talk. <laughs> no, no. I'm trying to think about it because we had a scenario like this where it wasn't quite like the Tetris piece that you've created, but we did have where the deployment map was slightly aggressive on one side. Because mm. I remember distinctly, I can't think of what the battle plan was, because I'd always put like like a five-unit cavalry, like a bunch of pistoliers, and I'd run up to the objective that was close to the border, and then the rest of my force would kind of swing. I can't think of what it is, but I love that mm. ability to go a little bit aggressive in one area. One um, area, right. Because you can't do that on the, on, the, on, the lower, on the lower no, side, you know? Just there's, there's quite a bit of space there. Yeah. I just can't yeah. think of what the battle... Like, I'm, I'm racking my brain trying to think of what the battle plan was, but... I dig it. Yeah, Assistant Ref just made the exact point I was going to make, which is the extra box is interesting because it forces castle armies to think about spreading out too. And I will also, like, along that line, uh, what it does... There's another reason Assistant Ref... Yeah, absolutely. It's a soft penalty to one-drops. I'm not going to cl claim it's the hugest mm -hmm. thing, but when you one-drop, you have to make a decision about going hard in that corner or not because you're just going to deploy everything, right? So if you're like a one-drop against a nine-drop, okay. They can see, are you pushing hard for that top spot or not? And suddenly their ability to reactive deploy is way more valuable 
because of the way that the deployment situation is allowing for them to make a decision. If they didn't go hard, I you can go hard. Like if they said no and don't go into that top spot at all and they castle on a lower point, you can choose then in your reactive deployment to go hard after their point, right? Or whatever, okay? So mm-hmm. it's ag- it, like it's a, it's not the biggest thing in the world. It doesn't completely stop Alpha shooting list or all that, but it is a nice soft incentive against one drops because they have a much worse time uh like sort of making a decision as to how they approach this without present without being able to see the enemy force also deployed right yep yep definitely on the so i mentioned there was always a middle objective in this mission over the years we started out with that middle objective they wanted to keep it we were just finding in way too many games it was incentivizing too much play in the middle and not enough play around the rest of the board and my in my opinion focal points is all about like that's one of the core uh, characteristics, constants of this mission is play around the board. Which was yeah, actually we just, one we just of my piece of feedback was, mm-hmm. is it, are they too close to the center? Should they be slightly um, up a little further? So it was an extra five inches or whatever it is. Like either way. Just bring yeah, coach, we, that was what, so specifically meaning, would you say, or what would you do? Like one, we so did like, try just for, yeah, go ahead. So like number one, for example, if you shift it in the middle of um, the, that first box, um, so mm. it's just, I, I don't know, like, is, I guess the question is, are they too central? Uh, and uh, are you just going to create like a big skirmish in the center? Or if you spread it out a little bit further, not completely to the sides of the board, but a bit yeah. closer, like does it create more space and maneuverability? Yeah, it's not too bad, you know, with this diamond formation. I think there is, we're generally finding there's enough space there. We also were trying to stay consistent with the grid, you know, and not necessarily doing sure, the like, objectives objective go on the cross sections. Literally yeah. to go on the cross sections. Yeah. But we, I mean, we did keep mind it is coach. 30 inches or, you know, 22 inches or something like that. I think so. It's, yeah, there, there is some difference there, right? Probably the only. Probably the only challenge is obviously that two and four are actually closer than one and three, right? But it, but I don't know that that's actually a problem. It might actually be interesting in that way into how it re- resolves sort of movement. Um, but yeah, it's it's I like this one a lot. I like that again. That's limited to one. I love this this scenario traditionally. I think this is the big winner of the pack for me. Is my honest answer. Um, just because this brings, I love the alternate deployment. I think it's really creative. I love all the soft decisions it's making there or implications for it. And I've always liked this scenario and, and this sort of competing objectives to push versus just be sort of safe. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. I'm so excited. This, to this have... is good. Yeah. yeah. Thanks guys. I'm excited to have people try it and yeah, send, send their feedback in. Yep. We can't All have right. your Dragon's Den pitch. We can't have your Dragon's Den pitch too easy, mate. We've got to we got to get some <laughs> feedback from the couch. Totally. All right, one more. <laughs> Forcing the hand. So this is our six objective scenario. So take us through this bad boy. Uh, so this was one of the two new ones that we got to GHB 2020, this and the Blade's Edge. Uh, I love this mission. I think a lot of people did. You know, and we... Again, tried a number of different iterations with it. Uh, I won't even go into the details. And well, I mean, I get a little bit of detail with it, but like we we tried a lot of different versions of this, and we eventually we kept coming back to the original recipe. So the battle plan map is using Feral Foray, basically yep, one of my favorite your, maps. Uh, again, we we tried out a lot of different maps in terms of this and. Nothing was quite working as well as just this the simplicity of this one. You know, we tried out prime objectives with some of these. wasn't quite working. We settled on just making none of them prime. Like, I think Feral Foray is the same as well, actually. It is, yeah. And so, yeah, that kind of get into some details on why we ended up there with Seismic Ship and how this works. But the core element of forcing the hand was i can remember what they called it at the time but what we're calling is basically you had a vital objective in ghb 2020 and your vital objective so vince coach and you were playing vince you go first coach picks one of his his three objectives to be the vital objective objective was worth three points which is other two objectives in his territory were worth one point each 
events, if you got that objective, that vital objective, you would get three points, right? It was, you know, pretty easy to defend your vital objective in rounds one and two, especially like early in the game. You got that thing on lockdown most games, I would say. So that, that was why we were a little worried about just copy pasting that into this one. You know, we thought, well, maybe it's, it's too easy to lock down what we're calling your vital ground. But that's where we ended up in the end, coming back to the original recipe with this. So vital ground at the start of each player's turn, the opposing player picks one of the objectives, again, that start the game wholly within their territory to be the vital ground. And for the scoring on this one, hold one, hold two, hold more, battle tactic, or one victory point if you control the vital ground. So yep. again, it's another mission where there's only one extra victory point that's on the table relative to the traditional. We tried it with a little more in terms of victory points. It kept being too much. We, uh, we were finding, you know, again, that a lot of games, the, it is hard to get that bonus point. But it was often coming up in rounds three, four, and five. Right. That's where it starts to matter, especially when you combine in seismic shift. Yep. I yep. love the interplay of seismic shift and vital ground in rounds three, four, and five. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to jump right on that. This one is one like this, and, and honestly, Pharaoh 4 does this to a degree already, so it's there, is that it uses seismic shift in a good way, right? Where it actually does... Mm -hmm make the game more interesting right when it happens it does tilt sort of the way the game plays the way it feels the way the way it's motivating you to move or not it, it's a big decision and you know somebody asked do you think it incur it rewards castles too much no because of the space that it's covering here again because most armies can't build a 30 inch castle and they certainly can't hold it that 30 inch castle for uh into those rounds three four and five i think the six objectives is the right call that's what makes the, this run Right. There's another thing, Vince. We tried out a smaller number of objectives yeah. and it just wasn't quite working. We were originally, we were at four most of the time. And it was uh, Colonel Cabbage had put actually the thought in my head of maybe just going back to the original six. And so we started trying out the six. And yeah, it, it was working better, especially with the seismic shift. Always trust Colonel Cabbage. That's just a rule to live by right <laughs> there. He's a wise man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, Coach, what do you think about this? Yeah, I like it. I, I think to your point, I was going to call out that comment as well, because a 30 inch castle, especially in third edition where there's less bodies, coherency is a lot harder. Um, that definitely would be much more difficult today than it ever has been. Um, the only other maybe comment I would say is, you know, an alternative approach with the vital ground could be at the start of the battle, you declare one of them to be the vital ground and it just stays mm -hmm. there. So as opposed to oh, rotating in each round, you uh, committed. And now it's about building the strategy to go for that one and defend that one. So I know there's been plenty of times where I, I know the scenario you're talking about where I've gone, oh, I'm kind of losing that flank. I'm now going to move it to the stronger flank. And it's just a game of moving it around. That's interesting, Coach. Yeah, we'll have to try that out. And I, I I'll make don't, get to... don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. That's an intriguing idea. Yeah, we didn't try out that. Iterate that 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 possibility. So I'll definitely make a note about that and and yeah, think about that for the future. Yeah, thanks. Yep. All right. Good stuff. So that's that's War Coda. Yes. As to, to answer the question, these are all available for download on AOS Shorts. You can find the link in the description. Use them in your games. Hit Tyler up with feedback, as he mentioned, uh, on Twitter, in the comments, anywhere like that. Uh, and so, uh, if, if, go quick, please. Events at aosshorts.com, um, tylermerson at gmail.com, Scrubby and Wells on Twitter. Yeah, uh, really looking forward to hearing as much feedback as possible. I mean, in terms of future steps with this project, like first and foremost, it's about is this in fact going to be useful to the community? So I'm just curious to see how this goes down. Like people find this useful, you know, event organizers especially. We've, you know, obviously we've started with missions that came out of Games Workshop. I think it's a little bit different conversation in terms of potential, like more directly custom battle plans and what that process might entail and all of that. But, you know, we'd, we'd love to update this annually. I think that would be really interesting, like have an annual supplemental pack that we could do. And maybe uh, every six months you have a refinement, like a six month window of refinement based on the prior six months feedback for that annual pack. Kind of where my head's at right now, but yeah. Uh, thanks, guys, for letting me 
blabber on hey, about this. I'm super excited about it because look, to return back to what we just said, mm-hmm. uh, we had five, maybe six, I think, valid battle plans for a GT in my mm-hmm. uh, in my estimation from the, the actual existing set right now. I think all four of these are perfectly valid for for tourneys. And what does that put us to? Basically the magical number of 10, right? Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, we've got... Now, now, Coach, to go back and answer your original question that you brought up before we started this, mm-hmm. boom, now we've got variants, right? Because when you're mixing from 10, we're in a great place. That Like, mm-hmm. you, you, can, you can play a bunch of different tournaments, have different mixes every time. Perfect. That's what we want. This is the world we want to live in, right? So totally. I, and probably the other thing I'd want to call out here is I love that the community is exploring ideas, and it's not just the the lore of the general's handbook and what Game for Workshop says. You know, we got introduced to that by like you know Dave, um, Dave that runs Nashville, right? Not Nashville, Nashcon. He could run Nashville. Uh, I'd let him do that. <laughs> you know, he, he introduced an alternative. He, he introduced an alternative approach to secondary objectives, you know, and some oh. really meaningful and deep ones. You know, we saw Something. Face Hammer try some house rules around Gotrek and things like that. It's mm-hmm. good. Like, I think we should explore it and try it and see what ifs. And if something doesn't work, cool, we learn from it. But there's so yeah. much available and bringing back some great battle plans. I'd even challenge people to look at maybe some of the White Dwarf battle plans, the narrative mm. battle plans, like from open play to see, can we turn these into match play battle plans? And, mm. you know, like you look at 40K and their deployment maps and the way they do things, there's lessons to draw from them uh, as much mm. as they're drawing things from us. Yeah. Uh, on the deployment maps, that's something we didn't even talk about is that, I mean, there's a conversation around how do different deployment maps change the existing battle plans that we have in GHB sure. 2021? I think that's yeah. an interesting conversation in itself. Yeah. Which we're definitely going to see in GHB 2022, right? Because at minimum, they love to do that, to shake mm-hmm. them up by maybe it's the same battle plan, but with a different deployment strategy. That that has often happened I, in, in GHB to GHB, so I imagine we're going to see that in play real soon. Uh, I agree with Brian S. The Lieutenant's Leaflet is a hit. Uh, so uh, <laughs> the Captain's Coda. Uh there you go. The sergeant supplement. Trying to figure out. Love all these. Trying to figure out one word, like a small number of words, or yeah, small number of letters. Uh, war, war coda. I tried, guys. It, that's quite a war process, coda is just name. fine. You, Official name, name war coda. Yes. <laughs> so Tyler, thank you. All these are available for download. I want to see people use them. I hope some tos grab them and put them in their tournaments. More, I should say, more tos because some tos have already used them in one days. So I'd love to see more tos grab them, put them in their list. Uh, shout out to Ziggy and. Uh, stats Rob from the Honest Wargamer, you're gonna have some new battle plans to uh, to calculate into your into your stats uh, once they start getting out in the wild. So I you know load those on up into the database. Uh, but Coach, thank you so much, buddy. This is super fun having you on. I'm glad we got you back on here. It's absolute Absolutely. pleasure. Thanks for the invite. I'm glad I took Thursday off. I I decided not to watch pro wrestling AEWs right now going on. Some big things have happened but I couldn't think of a better way to spend it with you lads. Well, I appreciate that greatly, brother. And as always, Coach's channel is linked down below as well. If there's any reason you aren't subbed yet to Coach and watching all his incredible videos, his incredible conversations that he's having with with so many amazing guests, then you have made a wrong choice in your life. So go sub him out. Find that link. Click it. Hit the sub. It's so <laughs> easy. That you wanted. <laughs> yeah, that's look. You're a better booker than us. There's no doubt about it. Uh, for all of you, hit that like button, subscribe, do all those fun things, click all those fun buttons. It's great. It's rewarding. Uh, and in all honesty, it does help other people find the show and help us in a big way. So we thank you for doing it, Tyler. Thank you, Coach. Thank you, all of you out there who are watching. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And as always, we'll see you next Wednesday.